audiobook title, Where Did It Go Wrong, 00-39, by Mass Chump, Prologue, In the past I would have been frightened to death being lost in the ocean, now I was glad, as my wooden boat was gently led by the ocean waves, I began to think about my past. Being reincarnated into this world was an interesting experience, there were good and bad, really bad dot 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 parts but the concept of magic made it worthwhile. While I did have problems stemming from my birth and talent, my biggest ones, the reasons I was in this stinky wooden boat, were caused by me. Just what did I do wrong? I thought to myself while munching on my dry rations. Even after stepping on this presumably, uninhabited island, I continued to question myself. I changed my approach each time, and this was the result. Just how did their personalities warp? It doesn't make sense unless this is one of those game world eyes guys. Unfortunately, I only played online card games my first life so I couldn't go any further with my conjecture and continued my journey into the island. The uninhabited island was a decent sized island with lush vegetation. I felt the tropical breeze tickling my nose, saw white sand stretched on for miles and tasted the delicious edible fruits I found slightly deeper into the forest. I decided on the spot, I will spend the rest of my life here. The island was in the middle of nowhere, and my pathetic mana and chi capacities ensured I would never get tracked. I used fire magic to burn my boat, erasing all traces of my presence here. It might seem counterintuitive, wouldn't I need my boat if they find me here? Ha ha, if they found me here I wouldn't have arms to row the boat anymore I laughed to myself eating another fruit. My peaceful life in another world cooking fruits begins now, please, please let it begin. I don't want them to find me. 113 Chapter 1 New Start The first few years of my new life were an interesting experience. Although I retained my memories and intellect, I couldn't control my body as I wanted to. In the beginning. If I tried to talk unintelligible gibberish came out, if I tried to control my bowel movements I failed, and I had an unsatisfiable urge to chew on anything in sight. It felt like I was drunk controlling a puppet, trying my best to humiliate myself. As I grew older, my sense of sobriety returned, and on the day of my fifth birthday, I felt like a person again. My name was Rorick, the first son of the first wife of Duke Pendle. My mother Alva was a lady who had brown hair and blue eyes, she made sure I had no problems growing up. My father, whose first name I never learned, had black hair and brown eyes. While he rarely showed up he treated me well whenever he saw me. I myself inherited my mother's brown hair and my father's brown eyes. From what I could tell, my mother and father had a marriage for political reasons rather than love. She never complained about his lack of visits, nor became happy when he visited. When he did visit, their only conversation was about making me the successor of the house. From my mother's conversations with her maid, my father spent most of his time with his third wife. While I was the only child of my mother, I had five half-siblings, two older brothers, one younger brother, and one older sister, and one younger sister. My siblings generally didn't like me but that was a result of my own mistakes. When I was younger, the humiliation of being unable to control myself caused me to stay in my room most of the time. As a result, my siblings regarded me as a weird person who stayed in his room all the time. By the time I realized and tried to fix my first impression, it was too late. Based on my surroundings, the world I was in was a strange mix of medieval and modern society sustained by magic. For example, instead of a sewage system attached to the toilet, the toilet somehow made everything disappear. When I asked my mother about it she smiled and told me it was a type of magic I would learn when I grew older. Speaking about magic, today, two weeks after my fifth birthday was the day I was going to get my capabilities as a magician tested. Based on what my mother said, a magician's potential depended on two things. The ability to gather and store mana, and the ability to understand and execute incantations. While the latter was important, the only thing tested as a child was the former. After all. Even if one could execute the most complicated incantations, it didn't matter if one doesn't have the mana capacity to use it. Interestingly, the type of mana affinity also affected one's mana gathering potential. There were seven mana types, light, dark, fire, earth, water, wind, and null, and six mana affinities, light, dark, fire, earth, water, wind, 
There was no null mana affinity because anything with a null mana type implied that it was usable by any magician. Of the six affinities, people with a light or dark affinity could store more mana than people with an affinity to fire, earth, water, and wind types. However, it didn't mean that people with a light or dark affinity would always gather more mana than others, rather. It meant if two people who were exactly the same, except one had a light affinity while the other had earth affinity, the light affinity user could gather mana faster than the earth affinity user could. One could also possess multiple affinities, which impacted their mana gathering potential, but it wasn't a 1 plus 1 equals 2 relation. It was more of a 1 plus 1 equals 1.3 relation. My mother wasn't very worried though. The Pendle family was known to have members with large mana pools and my mother had a large mana pool herself. The current belief in this world is that the size of mana pool is a genetic trait. Therefore she believed there was no way I wouldn't have a large mana pool. As I stepped off the carriage and followed my parents into the mage headquarters, I got excited as I realized this was going to be my first time feeling mana in this fantasy world. 98 Chapter 2 The Twists of Life It seems that genetic traits in this world follow the same principle as my last life. Despite the dominant genes of both my parents being large mana pools, I received the recessive traits of having poor mana control and poor mana capacity. My dream of being a magician in this life ended as soon as it began. As we got onto the carriage to return home, my father suddenly spoke to the driver. Now that we're in the city, we might as well get his martial talent tested. I hope for his sake he can at least comprehend can change our destination to the martial association. Wow this world has cultivation as well. Maybe this is my chance to become a peerless war sovereign and get all the jade beauties. I chuckled to myself while looking outside the moving carriage. Unfortunately, it seemed this world was a fan of kicking someone when they were down. Unlike mana, I couldn't even feel kick. The trip wasn't all that bad though. I got to see a real jade beauty this time. Although I couldn't see her face. I was definitely sure she was a peerless jade beauty. Why you ask? Her skin was as green as a jade. On the return to the mansion, my father only said one word to me, trash. While I felt it was pretty harsh calling your five-year-old son trash, at least he said something to me. My mother hadn't uttered a word to me after the first test. After we entered the mansion, my mother just told the servants to get a guest room ready for me as she shut the door. Mom what about my stuff? A few minutes later, a servant came back and escorted me to the guest room. Thinking about the current situation in my life so far, I started to get a bit worried. I wasn't worried about not being able to use kill mana. It's sad but I didn't use them in my first life either. I was worried about being assassinated. There were two main candidates for the next successor of the duke, the son of the beloved third wife, my older brother, who to my knowledge could use magic, and me, the talentless son of the first wife. Although he is better qualified for the role than I am in almost every way, I have the most important qualification, birthright. If I remained in the vicinity of the Duke's area, I wouldn't be surprised if I end up headless a few years later. As I pondered these somber thoughts I wondered why I didn't get any cheats from God. Although having memories of my previous life was helpful, I'm not sure it could be considered a cheat. I majored in computer science and there are no computers in this world. I can't shock the world with my cooking. Usually, I just eat cup noodles or throw a bunch of vegetables into a slow cooker. The only real advantage I got out of them was having my self-esteem lowered after becoming an infant. Well whatever, time to focus on my current situation. The next few days I thought up a few plans, running away, killing all the other sons and befriending my siblings so they don't kill me. With my current talents killing them is possible. Running away is a good idea but unless I become an adult I'd be brought back right away if someone claims I'm kidnapped. Befriending my siblings would work well early on but they would probably still kill me. In the end, to tie up all loose ends. Thinking about it closely, plan 3 ensures that I live early on, and plan 1 ensures I live later on. Combining them would be perfect. Patting myself on the back, I began drafting up plans to befriend each and every one of my siblings. Two years later, I got to see the fruits of my plan. 97. Chapter 3, Two Years Passing By. It's hard to get along with children. Six months into my plan I realized it was close to impossible for me to befriend any of them. My previous reputation as a weird person, 
combined with my poor talent, made them view me as permanent trash. When I went to greet them they'd ignore me, and if I tried to hang out with them they would intimidate me with magic and force me to leave. I thought about confronting them at times, but when someone threatens you by summoning fire in their hand leaving seems like the smartest choice. On the bright side, my siblings didn't involve themselves with me at the moment, if I didn't talk to them they ignored my existence. I was a bit surprised at this, where was the so-called childhood bullying I heard read in web novels. When I asked Finn, the second son of the third wife, my younger brother by one year, he just snorted and replied, as true Pendle blood. It's beneath me to mess with trash like you as he shoved me out of the way. I could sense this sentiment was gradually changing though, Then, the older son of the third wife and older than me by three years, started looking at me like he was sizing up his future prey. I tried my best to avoid him as much as possible. Other than my siblings, everyone else in the household had a cold attitude toward me. The servants in the household treated me politely but with a cold attitude. Trying to strike a conversation with them was similar to talking to a brick wall. Duke Pendle, whose name I later learned was Zala, treated my existence like air. A few months after I was deemed trash, my mother was pregnant and gave birth to another son a few months later. With a newborn hope in her life, she ignored my existence as well. I thought it was interesting how fast I was discarded, though I didn't mind it much. Just as they viewed me as a tool to bring them glory. I viewed them as a tool that allowed me to age safely. From the start, I could never regard them as my real parents. My real parents are. Well I wonder how they're doing right now. The last two years weren't all that bad though. I had a lot of time to visit the library and learn more about the world. The most important thing I learned about was the existence of soul magic. The third branch of magic that was deemed taboo. The only books that talked about soul magic in the library were history books and all them had the same few sentences. It was taboo magic that sacrificed the souls of the user, and it was eventually deemed taboo after being used in multiple rebellions that resulted in hundreds of thousands dying. There isn't enough information on soul magic just from these books, but looking at it from another perspective, if it was potent enough to fuel rebellions it meant that anyone can use it and it was powerful. It's worth trying to find more information on soul magic. I transmigrated so I should have a stronger soul compared to others. I thought to myself as I made a mental note on soul magic. Unfortunately, it was close to impossible to gather more information on it. Although I could roam outside the castle freely, I received no pocket money from the duke, and if I openly asked about taboo magic it might be the end of me. However, I did have a theory on how to learn more about soul magic. If it was illegal to use it, criminals would be the best people to ask, and the safest way to talk to criminals as a child is to talk to criminals in jail. Hence for the past year I got the nickname Prison Boy. It was surprisingly easy to force the jailers to let me visit the prisoners. Those employed by the Pendle family had to listen to the Pendle family, even if the one ordering them had little talent. No one in my family approached me about my constant visits to the prison. I guess it was too small a topic for them to even think about. I still have yet to find out more about soul magic, but I'm hopeful about finding a lead at some point. Regardless, the current situation isn't looking that great for me. I can't get close to my siblings and I have no real way to make money so I can't prepare much for escaping the dukedom, in my opinion. It was too early to prepare a specific escape route. While I was leaving the prison after one of my daily visits, I overheard the guards whispering. He's finally leaving right? Yeah finally. He comes here every day, does he want to be a criminal when he grows up? What a shame for the duke's family, although most of their children are talented. They have to raise a bastard and a future criminal. This small conversation shocked me. I knew who the future criminal was but I had no idea who the bastard was. Upon forcing them to reveal the specifics and promising I wouldn't let this conversation be heard by anyone else, I heard the shocking fact. I had an older sister I never knew about. After hearing about her general circumstances, I found it hard to stop myself from smiling. This girl is definitely going to be my ticket to safety in this house. Kaza the bastard of the Pendle family. I was going to befriend her no matter what. 100. Chapter 4. Kaza Pendle. If there's any child in this house who could claim they were treated worse than I was, it's Kaza Pendle, daughter of the deceased second wife and Duke Pendle, and two years older than me. 
Her life was at its peak when the mage qualification test revealed she was a prodigy with four affinities. She spent most of her time taking care of her sickly mother, who treated Kaza with love and affection. A few months after Kaza's mage test, her mother passed away and left a letter for Duke Bendel detailing her affairs. She confessed how Kaza was the result of her passionate night with an unnamed common man. After he confirmed Kaza wasn't his daughter, Kaza's life changed for the worse. While Duke Pendle wanted to banish, or maybe even kill Kaza, he couldn't just discard a future prodigy mage with four affinities. Thus, he converted an isolated storage shed into a living space for Kaza. Unfortunately, that's all he did for her. According to the servants, the shed was smaller than my current room, and the only thing he provided was a blanket, toilet, and books about magic. While she did get meals delivered to her, the quality was so poor even servants would avoid eating them. I wondered how I forgot her existence, but it seems like she was treated as a taboo in the mansion ever since her mother's death. Maybe I saw her or heard her name when I was very young. But once it became taboo I never heard of her again. Usually, if a prodigy like Kaza was treated so poorly, mages would try to adopt the child and raise them into a proper talent. In Kaza's case, no mage wanted to adopt a child at the expense of provoking the Pendle family. As a result, she remained trapped in the Pendle family for the last four years. This didn't stop Kaza's passion for magic though. According to the servants she spent all her time submerged in trying to understand magic. After gathering all the information I could on Kaza, I realized she was the perfect target. She had no friends, was treated worse than me, and had a bright future as a mage. As long as I could get on her good side, my safety was probably assured for the next decade in this house. It's worth noting that children in the country I live in, Alvin, anyone older than 18 is considered a full-fledged adult. How should I approach this girl? I wondered to myself eating a slice of bread. Of all the information I learned, three pieces of information were the most important. 1. She had no friends. 2. Her father ignores her existence. 3. She doesn't get to eat good food. I was curious about some parts of her, like why she cares about magic, but at the moment the most important thing was trying to become her friend. Although I felt guilty taking advantage of a suffering child, I didn't have much of a choice. I felt my death flags were slowly starting to increase, in fact, I could be considered to be doing her a favor, without me approaching her she'd have no friends in this household. That's right, doing this doesn't make me shameless, it makes me a good person. I thought to myself as I packed a few sandwiches in a bag. I had a few choices on how to treat her, I could try to approach her as a friend, a brother, or maybe even a father. Although trying to get her to love me might be a more effective strategy. If I purposely made a nine-year-old fall in love with me I would probably end my life myself. I also wanted to make use of the fact she was given poor meals by bringing her good food. As they say, the fastest way to make friends is to give people food. After some consideration, I discarded the father and brother approaches. I wasn't sure if she experienced some kind of trauma stemming from them but I couldn't risk it. This was my last hope after all. Approaching her as a friend and giving her food is probably the best option. I thought to myself as I forced a servant to bring me to Kaza's residence. After the servant guided me to the shed and scurried away, I started to wonder if someone lived here. The outside of the shed was in decent condition. The shed was relatively new but was starting to show slight signs of disrepair caused by a lack of maintenance. The most disconcerting thing was that there were no traces of human activity outside her residence. I wondered if she ever actually left her little abode. Well no point thinking about that right now. It's time to greet my newest friend, let's just knock on the door and hope for the best. This marked the first real encounter between the bastard girl and the prison boy of the Pendle family. At the time, I had no idea how big of a mistake this was going to be. 98. Chapter 5, Trial and Terror. Announcement. I'm going to try a different puff for the first time as an experiment. If you have any thoughts on the chapter please answer the poll and leave a comment. Kaza puff. My thoughts were interrupted by the sudden knock on my door. How strange, this isn't the usual time I get food. Is it Duke Pendle kicking me out? Maybe a mage would finally help me if I get kicked out. Maybe it's one of my siblings. But didn't my brother leave for the academy a few weeks ago? He was the only person who still showed up to harass in the past few months. Is it another one of my siblings trying to harass me? How annoying, I just want to focus on magic. 
When I finally learn search magic I won't be surprised by people suddenly showing up. As my thoughts continued to race, the second knock on my door pulled me out of my thoughts. Well, it's time to face the music I thought to myself as I opened the door. The door opening revealed a small kid holding a basket. He had brown hair and brown eyes and was a little shorter than I was. He seemed older than five but it didn't have any traces of being a magician. Thinking about it for a few seconds, I realized he was the first son of the first wife, the untalented kid who visited the prison almost daily. He is probably here to mock me. I thought to myself, I hate the fact that untalented trash like this can make fun of me without repercussions. After all, he is still a real pendel. If I tried to retaliate I would be thrown in prison again. We stared at each other for a few seconds before he opened his mouth. Hello, my name is Rorik. I remained silent. I heard you don't get good food, so I got you a few sandwiches. I couldn't understand. Why is he giving me food? Is he trying to feel good about himself? Does he think I can't even get decent food on my own? Is this talentless brat looking down on me? I couldn't stop myself from lashing out. Is that why you visit the prison? I'm sorry. You must feel so good about yourself, acting like a saint. I bet you don't help those prisoners out of goodwill, you just want to look down on them. I know what I was saying hurtful, but my pride couldn't take it. You think that just because you bring me some food, you have the right to look down on me? He remained silent. I may not be a real pendle, but I am a real mage, something you'll never be. If you think I'll let you feel like a saint by just giving me some food, you have another thing coming your way. I, Kaza, will not be humiliated by anyone, especially not by someone like you. Now if you understand get out before I blast you with my magic. He continued to say nothing, he simply put down his basket and left. When I saw him walk away I regained my senses. What have I done? Was this his plan? If he tells someone what I did just now wouldn't I go back to prison? I should have never fallen for his provocation. Those sandwiches are probably inedible anyways. I hated the prison, it's cold and hard to sleep there. I waited for my punishment, but a few hours later no one came. I let out a sigh in relief. He must have been too scared to tell anyone. I then inspected the sandwiches he gave me. When I realized they seemed eatable I took a bite. I'll admit it, it tasted better than anything else I've had the past few years. It's not that I liked or wanted to eat the food the servants gave me. I would not waste any time searching for better food. After all, I could spend that time learning more magic. Still, I did feel a little bad about it. He gave me food and didn't tell anyone about my outburst. Well it's not like it matters now anyway. He won't be coming back. He came back the next day. I was baffled. What was wrong with him? Is he a saint? Unlike last time. However, we didn't have a conversation. He simply handed me a basket and left. The basket contained lots of fruits. I realized how long it's been since I had fresh fruits. After finishing the basket in minutes, I felt a little regretful. Those were the tastiest fruits I had in years. I want to eat more. If he came back today he'll come back tomorrow right? He came back again. This time he brought sandwiches. I was a little regretful that he didn't bring fruits. But I had a more important thought in my mind. Why is he doing this? I got super mad at him the other day and he still comes back. Is he a saint? Or does he like me? I felt a little curious, so I had to ask. Are you doing this because you like me? Almost instinctively, he replied no and left. I felt a little sad when he said no so fast but didn't know why. Anyway. The sandwiches tasted great. But I missed eating fruits. I wonder if he'll bring fruits tomorrow. Sure enough, the next day he did bring fruits. As I stared at the basket in my hand, I realized the boy in front of me had the nickname Prison Boy. I couldn't help but ask. Do you bring the prisoners food as well? No, I'm only bringing food to you. Why are you only giving me food? I heard your food was worse than prison food. Did someone say that? Is my food worse than prison food? He must be saying that to make fun of me right? I wanted to argue with him but I was a little hesitant. My food really didn't taste good. If I made him mad and he left I wouldn't get to eat good food anymore. Although he didn't get at me three days ago, I still didn't want to risk it. Only bring fruits from now onwards. No problem. As I saw him leave I realized that I was looking forward to his next visit. He came back with more fruits the next day. I didn't understand. Why did he keep bringing me food? I didn't do anything for him. Why are you giving me all this food? What do you want from me? 
I wanted to be your friend. Friend? What a joke. It seemed that this entire thing was some kind of prank. My mood soured instantly. Why don't you try to be friends with your other siblings? We're both hated by everyone so you were the first person I thought of to be my friend. I suddenly realized who I was talking to. The untalented prison boy. Even if he was actual Pendle blood, there's no way anyone would tolerate him, even if he tried. He also said I was the first person he thought of to be friends with. Does that mean he valued me more than the other Pendle children? It made me feel a little happy. Come again with fruits tomorrow. I'm sorry about what happened a few days ago. No problem, I'll see you tomorrow. As I saw him waving me goodbye, I wondered what I should tell him tomorrow. He came back again the next day. This time, before he could hand me fruits, I decided to tell him what I was thinking about. Friends are people who help each other. You're helping me by giving me fruits, but how am I helping you? If I don't help you in return we can't be friends. So tell me, how can I help you? I decided to be upfront with my questions. If he said something like using me to protect him when he grew older, I would stop talking to him immediately. That relationship would be less like friends and more like the relation between the Duke and me. I don't want to owe anyone else. I was nervous about how he would respond. I liked the idea of having a friend who would bring me fruits all the time. He thought about it for a few minutes before giving me a response that shocked me. You could teach me magic. You? Learning magic? I heard you were so untalented that the Duke tried to test your kick capabilities right after he left the mage headquarters. That may be true but I still want to try. HMPH, stop joking with me and get out of here. Don't forget to bring fruits tomorrow. Alright. That night, I thought about what he said. If his talent was that poor, there was no way he could learn magic before I left for the academy. In that case, it would be useless for him to come here all the time. On the other hand, if he does come here, I'll be able to have a friend and eat fruits. When I thought about it harder, the choice I had to make was obvious. When he came the next day, I didn't take the fruits from him immediately. Rorik, you said you wanted to be my friend and learn magic from me right? That's right, I want to learn magic. As long as you keep bringing me fruits every day, I'll be your friend and teach you everything I know about magic. With the future Archmage Karna teaching you, you'll be a talented magician in no time. While I gestured him to come inside, I couldn't help but feel a little guilty. I was lying to a kid younger than me after all. Well. As long as I get fruits I'll feel better about myself. This was the first time I invited someone into my room since my mother died. Was this chapter good? Should I do more different poff stuff in the future? It was a good chapter, you should do more poff stuff. It was a good chapter, but you shouldn't do more poff stuff. It was a bad chapter, but you should still try more poff stuff. It was a bad chapter, and you shouldn't try more poff stuff. Total voters. 257. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Was this chapter good? Should I do more different poff stuff in the future? 103. Chapter 6. Results. I can't believe food was such an effective strategy. I should have used food years ago. I'm particularly embarrassed that I never thought of bringing food to the prisoners. I might have been treating the prisoners as NPCs who can give soul magic quests if I'm lucky. Maybe this world was a game in my past life, but now, it's real. I need to thank Kaza for giving me an important reminder. Speaking about Kaza, I couldn't help but feel a bit bad for her when I looked at the state of her house. It was a small area with three things, a bed, a smaller woodshed that could barely fit a person, and lots of magic books. There was one window near her bed which gave there were so many books on the ground that I thought the floor might have been made from books rather than wood. While I wondered where I was going to sit, Kaza created two stacks of books and told me to sit on them. Since you're here to learn about magic, tell me what you know about magic right now. It uses mana to cast spells. As expected, you don't know too much. I'll start by explaining things about mana types. Affinites and spells. If you have mana affinity X, you can produce X type mana and X type spells. Light mana is known for its defensive and healing capabilities. Although light mana can be used offensively, light spells have the weakest firepower of all affinities. Dark mana is known for its weakening spells and has average firepower. There are also some taboo branches of dark magic that I don't know much about. Earth and water mana are better at defensive spells and fire and wind mana are better at offensive spells. No type magic isn't a type of magic, 
it's just the category of magic that any magician can use. A lot of random magic falls in this category. Do you have any questions? Do you have a teacher? Nope, just like you tutors have no longer visited me since I was five. I learned everything myself. Stuff like magic is easy for a prodigy like me. I have to admit, I was impressed by her declaration. Unlike me, she doesn't have memories from her past. The fact that she can self-study at such a young age is astounding. Maybe mages mature a bit early? Either way, I guess she does deserve her prodigy title. Before I left, I asked Kazu a bit more about no-type magic. A lot of magic like summoning magic, augmentation magic, and even space magic all fell into the no-type category, but some spells were harder to create than others. There were some taboo branches of magic like necromancy and demon magic as well. I have to admit, Hearing all the different types of magic made me a little sad. Didn't I transmigrate? Why don't I get some kind of cheat? The more I heard about magic, the more hopeful I was getting about soul magic. I hoped my soul had some special properties because of my transmigration. By the time I finished my talk with Kazu it was late in the evening. I didn't have any plans for the night so I decided to think about my approach with the prisoners. Rather than looking at them as an opportunity to learn soul magic. I realized I should look at them as an opportunity to gain more resources. I can acquire food but, what I lack the most is money. If I could start selling food to the prisoners, I might be able to make a slush fund I can use when I run away. I decided to head to bed a little earlier than usual in preparation for tomorrow. 95. Chapter 7. Prison. Announcement. Thanks for reading. Be sure to answer the poll or give comments with feedback. I woke up earlier than usual and went to the prison with a basket of fruits in hand. Whenever I walked to the prison, I wondered why I was given so much freedom. The fact the Duke was letting a seven-year-old walk to prison almost daily was highly suspicious, but I couldn't identify his reasoning. Did that entire household forget about me? Although I hoped that I was the case. I knew it couldn't be so simple. The prison was separated into two compounds, one contained weak criminals, and the latter strong criminals. Usually, the weak criminals committed minor offenses, and the strong committed major offenses, so the compounds could also be considered to be separated by danger level. I wasn't sure where the compound for major criminals was. I never tried to visit it. The minor compound was located near the heart of the city. The prison also doubled as a sheriff's office. The prison was separated into three parts, the sheriff's office, which was located at the front of the building, the interrogation rooms, I've never seen these rooms, I've just heard the officers talk about it, and the jail cells, which were located behind the sheriff's office. Each cell usually contained one prisoner, I was told that if the prison ran out of the officers would start to group people. My usual activity inside the prison was talking to prisoners who wanted to have a conversation. Life in prison was depressing because one was stuck in your cell until the day of release. The only other entertainment besides my visits was writing letters to friends and family, most of whom never responded. As a result, my visits were a form of entertainment they looked forward to. After all, Everyone in the prison viewed themselves as a victim of unfortunate circumstances, so the prisoners felt that they could relate to me. There were quite a few strange people in this prison, Somba, the petty thief who kept getting caught, Eric, the martial artist who was trying to complete the tier 1 mage certification without mana, and Elgar, the one-armed swordsman who talked in a dialect I found hard to understand were just a few of the many characters I had become acquainted with. As I brought in the basket of fruits, a small commotion broke out. Hey look, he brought a basket. Wonder what's inside, maybe it's some kind of toy. No, I smell it, it's food. Seriously, that's the first time he brought a basket. He brought food, the little kid is growing on me every day. Hello everyone, I decided to be direct. I'm selling fresh fruits, highest bidder takes them. Ha <laughs> ha, the kid wants to be a merchant. Are you making fun of us? You bastard. We're all in prison. If we had any money on us then the guards would have taken it. If we had money we'd have bought our way out of prison. I faced palmed inwardly. I forgot this prison wasn't like the ones in my past life. They didn't need money because they could never trade. Then, I'll trade it for anything that interests me. I'll come one by one to each cell and it's first come first serve. As I walked around the room, the first few people tried to trade stories. They thought I was still a child after all. When they failed, 
The next few tried to bribe me with random spells or tips or martial arts techniques. I wondered if they were trying to spite me. They knew I couldn't use Kilmana. After that people started offering me any information they could think of. I wasn't given much useful information. I guess I expected too much from the prisoners. I traded a few fruits for rumors about the Blood Princess in the capital and about herbs in the nearby forest to show I wanted to trade. But as I neared the last few cells my fruit basket remained heavy. Finally, someone's whisper caught my ears. I've been in here too long and don't have much longer to live. The slop they serve here can't I don't have any information to give you. But what about a magic technique that you even you could use? The voice belonged to Taurus. He was a relatively well-known martial artist who focused on detection techniques. He became crippled after suffering injuries while murdering his teammates. Usually, murderers belonged in the other prison. But he suffered major injuries when he killed his teammates and became a cripple. He treated me relatively kindly after he realized I wasn't perturbed by his crimes. I wasn't afraid was because he was a cripple with half a step in the grave trapped in a prison. He could barely walk, let alone try to hurt me. He usually kept to himself but often bragged about how he was the greatest at detecting enemies. I had a good impression of him and thought he was trustworthy. I asked him for his pen and paper and wrote down if it's a soul technique blink once. He blinked. I almost couldn't contain my excitement. I hoped this was the technique he used to kill his teammates. After watching him scribble words down at a rapid pace, Taurus handed me a sheet of paper. Looking through the papers, I couldn't help but be slightly disappointed. It was a detection technique that sensed the souls of other people in its vicinity. Still, it was something I got in exchange for fruits so I can't complain. After handing Taurus the rest of the fruits and leaving the prison, I walked back to the Pendle Mansion. After hiding the papers inside one of the books, I took another pile of fruits and went to Kaza's house. She tried teaching me how to circulate mana, but after a few hours with no results, she shooed me away. I left Kaza's house in the afternoon. I had no other plans, so I decided to learn my new soul technique. Should I include a background story on Taurus? Yes. No. Total voters, 224. Cast vote view results. Oops, we ran into some problems. View results, should I include a background story on Taurus? 84. Chapter 8, Tracking. Early release today because no release tomorrow. Once I returned to my room, I locked the door and began studying the soul technique. Although it had no official name, I decided to call it tracking. I was pretty lucky because tracking seemed to be made for beginners in using soul essence what the book called parts of your soul. The essence of tracking was sending small unnoticeable wisps of soul essence around your vicinity while paying attention to each of them. When the essence collides with another soul, it would naturally dissipate. Therefore, you would know that someone, or something, exists in that direction. Tracking stated that the essence lost when using it was usually minimal and could be recovered relatively fast. On the other hand, it also stated that overusing tracking will cause one's soul essence to be permanently damaged. Lastly, the notes stated that the essence manipulation technique in tracking shouldn't be used to manipulate large amounts of soul essence. I was a bit disappointed with tracking. It only told you whether something existed in that direction. It didn't tell you anything else about the existence. It could have been worse I thought to myself, at least this can be used. In addition to the tracking. Taurus also wrote down his own notes. He stated that before one can start the first step in tracking, they needed to have at least felt a portion of their soul essence. It didn't matter how much they felt, but it would be impossible to learn the technique if they didn't feel it. He wrote down some tips from his personal experience, and concluded his segment by writing as you start to become more familiar with soul essence. You will develop more control over your body and movements. I had a sly grin on my face when I read that. What Taurus described was similar to what I felt during my childhood. It took me a few years to gain complete control over my body back then. I decided to test this by going right into the first step of tracking, feeling the essence. This step was simple. One has to meditate until one can completely sense one's soul. Although the description was rather brief, Tracking stated that as long as someone can feel their soul power, sensing the entire soul would only take a few days sensing was just a stronger form of feeling after all. For the next few hours, I meditated and accomplished the first step of tracking. Unfortunately, 
I could not feel my soul no matter how hard I tried. Although I was a bit worried about whether my childhood experience was actually feeling my soul, I decided to take it slow and not jump to any conclusions. I didn't expect to get a soul technique this early in my life, and therefore I have a buffer I can experiment with. Instead, I began to think about the first half of my runaway plan how I could increase Kaz's emotional dependence on me. What I aimed for when I approached her was someone who would try to save me at any cost. From what I knew about her so far she was so engrossed in her study of magic that I was the only person who actually held a conversation with her in the past few years. I'm not experienced in manipulation, but I feel like the first step in manipulating someone is to create trust and attachment to you. It shouldn't be too hard to establish those things. I'm the only real relationship she has right now. I'll wait for a month or two and see what happens for now. It's important that I keep bringing fruits and try to spend more time with her whenever possible. I decided to cancel my prison visits for the next month and focus on buttering up Kaza and understanding tracking. 91. Chapter 9. Rome wasn't built in a day. Announcement. The last chapter made this web novel have exactly 7,777 words. I decided to make a discord to celebrate this occasion. Don't worry about not joining, this will probably be one of those discords you join and forget about anyways. https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash b 746 my pfs. What have I done to entertain myself these past seven years? I read books, and more recently, visited the prison. If you asked me why I didn't do anything else in the city, I tell you I have nothing to do. No one would employ a seven-year-old child, the ones who employed seven-year-olds would rather get them from slums than a noble's house. I can't make anything from my past life because I was a consumer, not a producer. I used to laugh at those web novel protagonists, but now I wish how to make miso soup. I thought about making board games, but that brings up another problem, gathering materials. Without magic or kick, a seven-year-old like myself can't cut and carve wood. The only people around me I can ask for help are the servants, but they don't listen to me unless it's about food. Most importantly, I didn't want to attract any more attention to myself. If a seven-year-old waste created a popular board game out of thin air, anyone would find it suspicious. At the same time, I can't abuse my noble status by visiting any shops because everyone knows the brown hair brown eyed child from the Pendle family won't ever get support from the family. There are no public libraries in this city, although I was told that the major martial arts associations lend books to people who join their associations as a major warrior respectively. It seems that something similar to the printing press hasn't been created in this world yet. If only I knew how a printing press worked. The only thing walking around the city gets is stares of contempt and pity. Unfortunately, I'm not a masochist, so I tend to avoid doing anything in the city. I could go to the church, but I hold the gods in contempt. If they brought me into this world, I loathe them for not giving me some kind of cheat, and if they didn't I loathe them for letting someone transmigrate. In recent years, I've enjoyed my prison visits more than reading books. While books let me understand this world, the stories of the prisoners were realistic and provided more entertainment than the idealistic stories I found in the Pendle Library. Above all, talking to the prisoners was a form of social interaction I craved. After all, I'm a normal human unlike those major martial art freaks who lock themselves studying for years at a time. The room I live in is situated in an isolated corner in the mansion. I barely see servants let alone visitors. At the same time, talking to Kaza is like talking to a magic encyclopedia. If you ask a question on magic you will get an answer, otherwise tough luck. Our conversations usually went like this. Hey Kaza, how was your day today? What book are you reading? What are your affinities? You haven't told me yet. If you're going to talk instead of practice then leave. At this point I'm reconsidering whether buttering up Kaza is even worth it. She was supposed to be an insurance card and it's not like I'm learning much anyways. After the first few days, she told me to circulate mana till I formed my phylactery. The mana organ. The phylactery is supposed to form as a result of your body adapting to large mana intake, but with my talent, it's virtually impossible. On the other hand, I am making progress on tracking. I can't fully sense my soul. I can sense a vague shape. I wanted to spend the whole day meditating. But the manual said to only spend a few hours a day on meditating, 
any longer and you would be getting diminishing returns, if not outright wasting your time. Not going to prison was essentially a test of my willpower, it asked the question of how long I could spend my life without my premier source of entertainment. The answer was two weeks. When I arrived at the prison with fruits, the prisoners were quite surprised, this was the first time I took such a long break between visits. Little prisoner, what took you so long this time? Did you have fun learning Taurus's spell? I bet he's going to be the next Archmage now. Stop messing with him right now, and think about what we can say to get those fruits. I decided to make up a random excuse on the spot and just said I was mad because Taurus's spell was fake. Seems like the last thing Taurus did before his death was trick you. He passed the night after eating your food. I don't worry about what she said little prisoner. He died peacefully not because of the fruits you gave him. I was shocked when I heard about Taurus's death, but not sad about it. Taurus probably wanted to eat fruits as his last wish and I fulfilled it. I am a saint after all. The prisoners took my reaction differently. Wow he isn't sad at all. Looks like that guy did scam him. Yeah, for a second there I thought he gave the little prisoner a soul technique. He probably doesn't even know what that is. Don't get his hopes up. Are ah, you two make a good point. I'll explain it to him. Soul techniques are something like spells anyone can use, but they've been illegal for centuries now so they're hard to find. You dumbass, why would you tell him that? So he could give me some fruits of course. It's not like what I'm saying isn't well known anyways. I chuckled and gave him some fruits, then announced that I'm trading fruits again. Unlike last time, I didn't get a soul technique. I ended up trading fruits for some rumors about the underground auction some general knowledge of martial artists, and some general advice on how to improve my physique. The info about physique was the most helpful, I could implement it into my morning routine. Still, as I walked back from the prison I couldn't help but be disappointed. It took me years to make actual progress and now that progress is starting to stall already. As I started meditating in the mansion, I tried to console myself. It's okay. Making progress in two years was already incredible, I still have time. As they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. Monthly offspring report. For the eyes of Duke Pendle only. The Finn Kaza. Spending more time with Rorik. Does not affect Target's attachment to magic. Rorik stopped visiting prison after getting spell from prisoner. Hypothesized that spell was soul technique, due Target's rejection of all spells except this spell, due to Target's increasing time spent in Rome and due to Target not visiting visiting prisoners, disproven after Target revealed lack of prison visits stemmed from anger caused by being tricked. End of report. 98. Chapter 10. Every story has a start. The next month was doing a few actions on repeat, practicing tracking, going to prison, working out, reading books, and visiting Kaza. I managed to sense my soul after a few weeks and moved on to the next step circulation of the soul essence in my soul. Tracking specified that this specific form of circulation prevented large amounts of soul essence from escaping when performing the third step of tracking. I think tracking also said this circulation could be used for other soul techniques, but I burned Taurus's notes a few days after I got them. I was a little scared of carrying notes about a soul technique in my room. I wrote down the main parts of each step of the three steps in tracking in three separate books in my room just in case I needed to refer to them. I planned to burn these pages after I finished the third step of tracking so no one knows I have a soul technique. I've been going to the prison daily with fruits. I'm glad the Pendle family is wealthy because the number of fruits I've used in the past couple of months could feed a few families. However, I no longer exchange fruits for information, I simply give the fruits to the prisoners equally. I felt my time in the prison was less enjoyable when I traded fruits because the prisoners were more focused on speaking to me to get fruits than speaking to me to have a conversation. The effects of giving away fruits were better than I expected, more people spoke to me, and they continued to tell me random tidbits of knowledge. Somber and a few other things have taken it upon themselves to teach me some dagger techniques by substituting the dagger with a pen. They said my dexterity made me a natural thief, but I knew that the dexterity I displayed was because I was successful in sensing my soul. The tips I got on my physique from the prisoners were useful, I felt myself getting stronger at a faster rate than before. My goal with training my physique was just to be in shape, even if I was the strongest person in this world, I'd get crushed by any random martial artist or wizard. 
I continued to read books when I was bored but I read books for enjoyment, not knowledge. For the past few days, I've no longer visited Kaza, going to her shed was boring. At first, I tried to entertain her by bringing books I thought she would be interested in. I brought some books on history, on magicians, and some on romance. I thought girls enjoyed these novels, but she ignored all of them. Next, I tried to introduce her to tic-tac-toe, thinking she'd enjoy a simple strategy game. She simply ignored the game and focused on reading magic books. When I saw she ignored tic-tac-toe, I seriously wondered if people in this world matured faster than I thought. No child in my previous life could resist a game of tic-tac-toe. I could have tried reading books in the room, but why would I read in that cramped shed when I can read in my room or the Pendle Library instead? Although she had magic books in the room, something the Pendle Library didn't have. Reading those just made me bitter. I decided to give up on increasing Kaz's emotional attachment to me for now. Although I could have probably tried harder. I didn't want to. I already treated this nine-year-old better than I've treated myself these past few years. If she doesn't care then why should I do more? I'll just try the food strategy with some of my other siblings later and see what happens. Although, I will occasionally visit her to give her some fruits. I do pity the way she lives. As I walked out of my room and was about to close my door, I was greeted with a shocking sight. Black hair that fell to her shoulders. Grey eyes that stared at me, coupled with a small nose and red lips, I saw Kaza in the corridor. Why haven't you visited my room in the past week? I've been busy the past week, plus the number of fruits I gave you should have been more than enough for a week. Then where are you going with those fruits right now? The prison. I've never seen someone's face contort with anger this quickly in my life here. Not even when my parents found out I was talentless. Kaza Poff. One week ago, having a friend is great. I thought to myself. It's been so long since I've had someone sitting next to me and talking to me. Ever since my mother died, everyone ignores me. Even if they do talk to me, all they do is call insult my mother by calling her a whore and calling me a bastard. I don't care when they insult me, but I hate when they insult my mother. All she did was make one mistake. But Rorik is different. He never insults my mother and he gives me food. Despite everyone treating me like I'm a disgusting animal. He treats me even better than a regular person. He treats me like a friend. If only he was a magician, then we could spend the whole day talking about spells. I want to talk to him more, but I feel like I forgot how to have a conversation. It's been four years since I've had one. I feel a little bad for ignoring him when he tries to talk to me, but it's okay. I've been practicing and soon I'll be able to have a real conversation with him. These days I've been happier to see Rorik than see his fruits. Speaking about his fruits, he brought me a lot today, enough to last me two weeks. I should tell him to stop giving me fruits for a few days otherwise I won't be able to finish them all. Six days ago, how strange, he didn't visit today, I guess I have more time to focus on magic. I'm a little sad but it's okay. I'll see him tomorrow after all. Five days ago, he didn't come again, I wonder why? I'm sure he's just sick or something. There's no way he wouldn't come if he could come after all. Four days ago, I'm not sure why, but the fruits don't taste as good as they usually do. Three days ago, Rorik must be sick, otherwise he would have visited me by now. I'm so bored without his visits, I guess I can look at the stuff he gave me. Haha, <laughs> he sure is dumb. This game he made is so easy. Even a baby could tell it's always a draw if both people do everything right. I guess I can check out some of the books he got me. The history books are long and boring, and the magician books are almost as long as the history books but have almost nothing about magic in them. At least the other books he gave me are a little interesting. People in these books get tricked a little too easily though, like how could George listens to Lisa instead of Selina for choosing a present for the Queen. It almost got him killed. At least George and Selina end up happy in the end, while Lisa ends up dying. I've noticed that all of the shorter books he gave me talked about love. My mother used to talk about love as well. She told me that there were no mistakes in love, and it was the best emotion anyone could feel. I wonder when I will feel it. I'm sure Auric will come tomorrow. I'll just focus on studying the light spell haste for now. Two days ago, he still hasn't visited. How sick is he? Is he close to dying? I want to go out and visit him but going outside is scary. When I'm inside my house no one is mean to me. But when I'm outside everyone is mean. Rorik is the only person who was nice to me. 
Without him, I'm a little lonely. One day ago, I just realized that Rorik is as hated as I am. What if they don't send anyone to cure him? I'll focus on fully mastering the light spell elementary cure today and visit him tomorrow. I bet he'll be really glad when someone cures him. I think I remember him saying he lived in the southern corner of the house. I think I know where that is. Today, the outside wasn't as scary as I imagined. I didn't meet my siblings and the servants didn't do anything to me. I should have gone outside to look for Rorik a lot earlier. Finding Rorik's room was easier than I thought. I just had to cast elementary detection and check every room where detection magic detected on presence. I noticed it earlier, but elementary detection detection doesn't work on Rorik because he doesn't have mana or ki. While it works on everyone else in this household because they do. As I neared the last room that I didn't check, I saw the door opening. I guess the healer was coming out of the room, I'll wait for him to leave before I visit it. But it wasn't the healer who was outside. It was Rorik. I was happy because I thought he recovered, but something was strange. As far as I know, if someone without much mana gets cured with healing magic, they show signs of tiredness for a few days. But Rorik didn't seem tired at all. Are the after effects of healing magic gone already? If they were already gone, then he wasn't very sick at all. Why hasn't he visited me? I decided to ask him directly. Why haven't you visited my room in the past week? I was lonely when you didn't come. I've been busy the past week. Plus the number of fruits I gave you should have been more than enough for a week. What an obvious lie. What would someone like him be busy with for a week? The fruits weren't the point. I wanted to know why you didn't visit me. Then where are you going with those fruits right now? I bet he's going there instead of visiting me. The prison. Instead of visiting me. He's visiting prisoners. He'd rather go spend time with scum instead of time with me. Why I thought we were friends. This was the angriest I've been in the past two years. Calm down, calm down. There has to be more to the story than this. That's right. We were great friends. I couldn't think of a single reason why he spends time with prisoners instead of me unless he was tricked. That's right. Rorik isn't very smart. It would be easy for those people to trick Rorik. They must have been like Lisa treating him well and complimenting him, only to eat his fruits. I needed to open his eyes to the truth. I opened my hand towards him. Come with me. I'll show you the truth. Why is he hesitating? I bet those prisoners threatened him to never visit me again. That's why he isn't following me. If they threatened him to make him listen, all I have to do is threaten him to make him listen to me. I cast elementary fireball and glare at him. He grabbed my hand in a few seconds. I knew they must have threatened him. There's no way he'd leave me for them. He really is too foolish for his good. How could he get scared of those prisoners? They can't hurt him. I need to take better care of him. Otherwise, he'll be tricked by those prisoners again. I'll show him what a good friend I can be. 108. Chapter 11. Acceleration. Announcement. Thieves greater than scouts or rogues. I didn't understand what happened. How did Kaza leave her room just to look for me? Usually she doesn't leave her room because it decreases the time she spent learning magic. I knew someday someone would try to stop my prison visits, but I didn't expect it to be Kaza. After she dragged me back to her shed, she started an explanation on why prisoners are bad people who can't be trusted. I was confused at first, but soon after I realized that she thought the prisoners didn't want me to talk to her. I'm not sure how she jumped to that conclusion, and I was about to fix it but I decided to let it be. I can't exactly tell her the reason I didn't visit her was because of her attitude, not after she threatened me with fire magic. I underestimated the impact I had on Kaza. I thought she wanted to focus on magic and didn't care about talking to people, but it seems like she craved social interaction as much as any person. The fact she insulted prisoners for about an hour emphasized this fact, and as I left, she said I didn't need to bring fruits until she asked for them. As this entire friendship was usually just a fruit trade, I was happy to see fruits being removed from the equation. Our relationship is pretty decent right now, I can take a break from thinking about it for a while. I did promise Kaza I wouldn't visit the prison anymore, but sometimes promises must be broken for the greater good. It's not like she would be able to find out anyways. To ensure she doesn't try to find me again. I decided that I would start visiting Kaza daily. My visit to the prison this time was a little more interesting. I learned that the underground auction was attacked and robbed, which sparked underground organizations that had a stake in the auction to go on a rampage, and that Arik actually completed the Dear One Mage certification without mana. 
but was soon caught, and is now being interrogated by the Mage Tower. I felt a bit bad for Eric. He had been trying for years, and now that he accomplished it he's being interrogated. I was still sad that I didn't learn any new soul techniques, but at least I was learning dagger techniques relatively fast. The scouts and rogues who were teaching me said they permitted me to practice at home using an actual dagger or knife. They didn't want me practice with a real weapon earlier because they were afraid I would hurt myself. I returned home and practiced my dagger techniques. The scouts said that their techniques focused on the essence of the dagger, simple attacks that were direct and short, because the dagger is a short weapon. A dagger user had to have a brave heart. The essence of using a dagger focused on taking the initiative, having good movement, and committing to the strikes. One good strike was better than ten half-hearted ones, without a brave heart. A dagger user wouldn't be able to display these qualities. I wasn't sure whether I had a brave or timid heart, but I was happy to be learning something new. I wondered whether my brothers were learning sword techniques. I knew that they had tutors to instruct them, but I'm not sure what they taught. This simple routine continued for a few months, and Kaza turned 10 and I turned 8. There was no real celebration for either of our birthdays, for hers I gave her more fruits than normal, and for mine, she finally told me her mana affinities, light, dark, fire, and wind, and that she was close to becoming a tier 2 mage. I was surprised about her affinities but shocked that she was close to a tier 2 mage. According to what I know, the Noble Academy, which Kaza will be attending in three years, took five years and required mages to be tier 4 to graduate. At this rate, wouldn't Kaza be able to graduate early? She does live up to her title of prodigy. I'm not sure how she knows she's close to a tier 2 mage, but I didn't bother asking, there was no reason for her to lie to me about this. Kaza and I were still good friends. I didn't see a need to make her more emotionally attached to me at the moment. I also borrowed a knife from the kitchen, and have been using it to practice my dagger techniques. I'm not sure how good my technique is, but I feel like I'm not bad right now. In addition to my dagger techniques, I was able to finish the second step of tracking. The third step of tracking was the most important one letting out the wisps of soul energy and feeling when they disappeared. Tracking said that anywhere from 50 to 100 could be considered adequate for real-time use. I decided to go for 100 strands, just so I can feel a little more accomplished. Months turned into a year, and I turned 9 and Kaza turned 11. I managed to fully comprehend tracking and spend my time focused on my dagger technique. My attacks were getting swifter and more decisive, but without a real enemy. I have no way of making sure my attacks were effective. I decided to join the adventuring guild once I became 10, old enough to register, to test out my prowess. At the same time, Kaza had already become a tier 2 mage. I have no clue about her progress towards tier 3. We started having more conversations, and she started reading the books I got her. It seems that she likes romance books. I guess all girls her age do. Our relationship wasn't anything romantic though. It was closer to brother and sister than anything else. Kaza never found out I was visiting the prison, she never checked after what happened that time. As I thought these peaceful days would continue, something I expected years ago to happen finally happened. I was finally confronted by my siblings. 99 Chapter 12 A Brief Meeting Announcement Sponsored Chapter Credits to Anonymous When I saw three of my siblings in front of my door, I was happy. I was able to sense their presence through tracking before they even knocked. This wasn't the first time I've used tracking, but the fact I was able to do something similar to a spell always made me happy. However, I didn't show my happiness on my face. There was no reason to provoke my siblings. While Finn and Lena, my younger sister, shared my emotionless expression, Finn however, looked at me with a gaze of enmity and spoke. Father has called a meeting with all of us, follow me. They didn't wait for my reply and started moving to the duke's study. I thought we were going to pick up my younger brother, but I guess he's still too young. We entered the duke's study through the right hand side. I was surprised at how normal the duke's study looked. There were bookshelves with a combination of documents and books on the left and right hand side of the wall. There was a guest area that consisted of four couches surrounding a table in the center of the room. Towards the end of the room. Duke Pendle was seated on his chair surrounded by documents and a butler. On the wall behind the Duke were windows that were taller than me. When Finn shut the door, 
The Duke began speaking. Your elder brother Lenan will be coming back from the academy in a few months. Once he comes back, we will be hosting his engagement party. His fiancée, Ludmilla, is expected to visit our house soon. Despite your differences, I hope to see all of you maintain a cordial relationship. Do not offend her. Marquis Venson is someone we cannot afford to offend. If you have no questions, all except Chorik are dismissed. After they all left, Duke Pendle shot a look that had a mix of pity and indifference at me. Your only appearance in the mansion for the next two months will be a brief greeting during the dinner party. Learning etiquette won't be necessary for you. All you need to do is greet the Marquis family and leave. Judging by how you've kept yourself the past few years something like this won't be needed to be taught to you. However, you are not allowed to visit the prison until Marquis Venden and his family leaves. I understand you've been frequenting Casa the last few years, as she is required to move as well. I'll put you two in the same residence so you can entertain yourselves. You can loiter around that area but you cannot come near the mansion. You've also been playing with dagger techniques for some time, haven't you? As a reward for listening I'll hire a rogue to teach you. You may now leave. However, I didn't leave just yet. I knew this was an opportunity that I needed to utilize. Give me money as well. Pardon? Give me a monetary reward for listening. I'll guarantee that I won't even step out of my residence until Marquis Venson leaves. You're quite shrewd. It isn't difficult to accommodate your request. I'll grant you a monetary reward as well. You are dismissed. Prepare your luggage. A servant will come to pick you up in the night. Thank you, Duke Pendle. As I left the study, I couldn't help but think I underestimated the Duke. Although I thought he didn't care about my actions, he had a full grasp on everything I've done the past few years. I didn't expect him to be this aware of my actions. I can guess that he has someone keeping tabs on me but it would be relatively impossible to figure out anything else about the spy. Thankfully, it seems that the only thing he doesn't know about is my soul technique. Practicing in secret was a good idea. Other than that, I couldn't help but feel a little happy. I'll finally be able to have money. Having money will allow me to progress other aspects of my running away from the Pendle family plan that I've been pushing to the side for now. Having a real teacher for my dagger technique will also be helpful for the future. I need to practice with someone else if I am to improve. Although not being able to visit the prison for a while makes me disappointed, the benefits outweigh the costs of listening to Duke Pendle. Plus, I won't be living in isolation. I can still talk to Kaza whenever I'm bored. I didn't have much stuff to pack, the only things I wanted to take with my are books and clothes anyways. Instead, I decided to head to the library to stock up on books. I won't be coming back for at least a month, so I started picking up as many books as I could. I guess I should pack a few books for Kaza, she's been liking those romance books a lot lately. 104 Chapter 13, New Residence I thought I would be living in a shed. Instead, I found myself face to face with something similar to a run-down hotel. The walls of the building seemed to be built with moss instead of wood, and there were more holes than windows. I suddenly wished I could live in a shed instead. While I was having pointless thoughts, the servants who guided me here were busy putting my luggage inside. The one who led them was the same butler I saw in the Duke's office. As he guided me inside, he began to speak. Although the exterior isn't up to par. The interior has been refurbished, and the holes on the roof have been patched. He pointed upwards, implying I should check for myself. He was right. The roof was patched, and everything inside seemed new. I no longer wished to live in a shed. Seemingly satisfied with my expression, he pointed at a room and continued your luggage has been placed in this room, and your meals will be delivered daily. The master has told me to tell you that if anyone asks what you are doing in here, you are to say studying administration. If you have no other questions I shall take my leave. I was too busy thinking about how this huge hotel will be my residence to respond to him. Everything here was bigger than I expected, even the bed in my room. It was like life gave me an upgrade for no reason. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad if I continued to stay here after Marquis Venson left. The butler picked up on my happy atmosphere and silently left along with his colleagues. I was still stuck in dreamland when my door slammed open, shattering my dreams of being a hotel owner. Looks like Kaza came here earlier than me. Hey Rorik. Looks like you got kicked out too huh? What do you mean kicked out? I got upgraded, so did you Kaza. Upgraded huh? You are positive in any circumstance huh? You aren't exactly wrong though. 
This place is much bigger than the shed I lived in. Do you know why we got upgraded? It's your brother's fiance. It seems she will be staying in the mansion waiting for your brother so they can host there. I stopped speaking as I noticed Kaza starting to frown. I tried my best to switch the topic. I brought as many romance novels as I could hold with me. I could see her expression brightening in real time. It's late right now, so I'll give them to you in the morning. It's fine you can keep them for now. It'll take me a few days to finish the ones you already brought me. She was about to leave my room and close the door when she suddenly stopped and stared at me with a strange gaze. By the way, you did stop going to the prison when I told you right? Of course I did I lied without batting an eye. The last time she threatened me with a fireball, what if she threw one at me this time? Why would you think otherwise? It's because I overheard the servants saying you'll be miserable because this will be the first time you can't visit the prison for months. Those damn bastards, why aren't they more careful with their words? Don't they know magicians can make the walls speak? Don't trust the servants Kaza, don't you already know that in this mansion, you can only trust me and I can only trust you? Kaza seemed satisfied with my answer. I saw a large grin across her face as she shut the door, saying that's right, we can only trust each other. Although she repeated what I spoke, something seemed off about her tone. I didn't put too much thought into it. It was getting late and I wanted to rest. The next day, after eating breakfast, I began the next phase of my runaway plan, choosing a country to escape to. Alvin, the country I live in, is called the Vanguard Nation. It's landlocked by mountains in the north and has the sea to its south. To its west, it has countries with friendly ties, and to its east, it faces the land of monsters. There isn't too much information on the land of monsters from the books I have, from what I can tell. It's just an area of land where many monsters reside. I didn't dwell too much on the east side. The Pendle family was a dukedom on the east of the kingdom. I narrowed down the possible escape countries. Tenvira and Elsene. Tenvira accepted refugees and didn't have strong ties to Alvin, so it would be an easy country to hide in. Elsene was known as the mage country and had a reputation as a tourist country. With the influx of people visiting daily, I thought it would be hard to figure out when I entered and when I exited. Although I focused on these two countries, I didn't eliminate the other ones either. As I continued to ponder which country I should escape to, I was approached by Kaza. Are my chapters too short? Should they be longer? Yes. No. Total voters, 221. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Are my chapters too short? Should they be longer? 100. Chapter 14. New Day. Kaza had large bags under her eyes and bed hair that made her look like a witch. She pointed at the stack of books and asked which piles are mine. I pointed at two stacks farthest from me, those two. Do you need help carrying them? No need. I'm pretty strong myself. She was right. She carried one stack with each hand. I was a bit surprised, and I couldn't help but ask, How are you so strong? I told you this already, but when people gain a phylactery, their body naturally becomes stronger. She paused for a bit before adding I oh, don't worry, you've been practicing gathering mana for a few years now. You're getting closer by the day. Before I could reply, she already left. In truth, I had given up hope of being a magician five months ago, it was apparent that I lacked talent. I still practiced when I was with Kaza. But I knew that the only way I could create a phylactery was through a fortuitous encounter. In truth, I was thinking about something else. I knew that mana and ki caused the body to form an organ once the body accumulated enough, but what about soul power? I wondered if it was possible to increase the amount of soul essence in the body through ingesting souls. I've tried to sense the souls of others for the past few months but it's harder than I expected. I've tried experimenting with other aspects of soul essence to increase the tools at my disposal. I tested my body like a martial artist, or throwing out soul essence like a magician throws out spells, but all attempts so far have been unsuccessful. The problem stemmed from allowing the essence to leave my soul. Without the circulation technique of tracking, soul essence is released too quickly. The circulation technique of tracking doesn't allow enough essence to do anything other than tracking. It's frustrating, but I know I have to still try. The reason I'm experimenting with soul techniques is simple. I need a trump card in case things go wrong. Although I have insurance in the form of Kaza, insurance does not everything, 
including out-of-country damages. A few minutes after Kaza left, I put away the book I was reading and went outside to practice dagger techniques. None of the servants noticed it, but I smuggled a few knives with me before I left. Perhaps I'm spending too much time at the prison. I decided to pretend a chair I found is an enemy and began practicing. I stabbed through the holes in the chair with the front of my dagger and hit the chair with the back. I also kicked and punched the chair, although I didn't hit the chair too hard. The chair committed no crimes. After a few hours of practice, I heard Kaza scream it's too loud. So I decided to stop for the day. Instead, I visited Kaza's room. Kaza's room was a blast to the past, it was like she never left her shed. Because I started bringing her books as well, I think there might have been even more books than in the past. I started stacking books into the shape of a chair and greeted Kaza, who was engrossed in her book. How's it going, what magic are you practicing today? No magic, I'm just circulating mana today. In case you're wondering, I can do it subconsciously now so I can spend time reading the books you got me. Which book are you reading? She took her eyes off the book and started to reply. It's called Two Paths That Never Cross. It's about two generals that fall in love during the war. When the two generals first met, neither knew the identity of the other. They fell in love at first sight and were heartbroken that they were at war with each other. The book talks about the struggle both of them face between their duty and love. I didn't hear the rest of it because I began tuning it out. I found it hard to focus on books in the romance genre. I knew most of the cliches already and find the romance to be annoying. Instead, I began stacking books to form armrests. I was aiming at creating a book throne for myself. As I was stacking books for the second armrest. A gust of wind blew down the first time rest I made. Kaza started tapping on a nearby book. Do you really have to ignore me every time I start speaking about a romance book? While trying to restack the broken armrest, I replied you know I find this genre incredibly boring. As I was stacking the first armrest, she blew a gust of wind again, knocking down my other armrest. It's better than those books you read. They have as little depth as the strength your armrests have. I just scoffed and finished rebuilding my first armrest. Unlike last time, I added some books behind the armrest to prevent it from being knocked over. While I started to rebuild my second one, I felt a gust of wind behind me. However, this time, the gust didn't knock down my pile of books. I wryly smiled and said, maybe my books have more depth than you thought. Without missing a beat. She blew a stronger gust of wind and broke down my armrest. Nope, I don't think so. The pattern of knocking down and rebuilding continued until dinner was brought to us. After eating dinner, we spoke for a bit on random topics before I finally brought up a question I wanted to ask. What did the Duke give you in exchange for listening? He gave me some money. He told me I can go to the Noble Academy earlier, instead of two years later. It's one year now. I was happy for her. This was her ticket out of the Duke household. If she managed to attract a major's attention in the academy, she could train under them without caring about Duke Pendle. I wondered if this was his plan all along. But I can't figure out his intentions. Why not let her go under a mage directly? Either way, once she becomes famous at the academy, I'll be known as the future Archmage's friend in the Pendle household. They would think twice before harming me. As I continued to mull this over, Kazu asked me a question with some sadness in her voice. Once I leave, won't you be lonely? Focus on your own stuff, for now, I'll be fine. Don't worry, I'll somehow try to bring you out once I graduate. I was thankful for her thoughts, but I didn't care much about her declaration. It'll probably take her a few years after the academy to actually bring me out. By that time I'll probably be long gone. After conversing with Kazu a bit longer, I decided to head to bed. As I was drifting off to sleep, I couldn't help but thank Marquis Venson again. 97. Chapter 15. New Day, 2. I spent my days peacefully in the rundown hotel. After I finished familiarizing myself with the geography of the continent, I realized just how far my plan had already progressed. I was probably close to 60% done with my plan. All I needed to do decide on one country, pick a route and escape. The reward I get from living here should be enough to sustain my travel and living expenses while I was escaping. The Pendle household is not stingy with rewards, so there was no need to focus on money. The only thing I wished I could do was to learn a few more soul techniques, but it's unlikely I find a new one. 
In the meantime, I've also stopped my daily dagger practice, I'm in no rush to learn and I'll get taught in a few months anyway, I'd be a fool if I didn't take the time I have right now to relax. I even stopped counting the days I spent here. My life finally felt like the stories I read about in the past. All I did was read and wander around the hotel. I did go outside a few times, but there's nothing notable other than nature. It's much more interesting to wander the abandoned rooms of the hotel. At first, I blindly walked through them, imagining what kind of people would have visited the rooms. Recently, while I was wandering, I found some spare change hiding in the corner in one of the rooms, marking the beginning of me searching through each room like it was a crime scene. Kaza was confused as to what I was doing at first, but when she saw the money I found, she put aside her magic training to look around with me. For the past few days, all we've done is turn every room upside down, as of right now. 25% of the rooms here have been thoroughly searched. When we first started searching, Kaza used her magic to move the leftover furniture and search around. When I told her to do it without magic, she looked at me like I was an idiot. I tried to explain searching was more entertaining without magic, but she didn't listen. After a few more rooms, because she got bored, she decided to listen to me. Fortunately, for her, searching the rooms without magic truly was more fun and she started to enjoy herself, looking at her like this, it felt like I did have a younger sister, we decided to split the loot 50-50, I was a bit disappointed, all we found were some more coins and a few rags, but Kaza was excited even if we didn't find anything in a room, this might be the first time she's done something other than studying magic or talking to me that she's done in the past few years, so I guess it makes sense that she's excited, currently, we were on our lunch break, usually, we both just read books and didn't talk while we ate. Today, however, Kazu asked me a strange question. Why were you so nice to me from the start? I almost choked on my food. She finally started questioning my intentions. Luckily, I already prepared for this. After swallowing, I started to carefully choose my words. Because we're brother and sister, but the others, siblings, didn't treat me as well as you have. They didn't treat me that well either. Why are you thinking about something like this right now? She narrowed her eyes I was wondering if you have any additional motives for befriending me. As I said earlier, we're brother and sister, but we aren't related. Now that I think about it, she's right. We aren't related by blood. I had to think carefully about my next response. If she figures out that I wanted to use her future reputation, I would be in a lot of trouble. After some thinking, I responded with being brother and sister is determined by how we treat each other. As long as I treat you like a sister, and you treat me like a brother, without a doubt we are brother and sister. I almost cringed at myself saying this line. It was incredibly corny, but I hoped that she would buy it. It seems like she did. She never asked me about this again. We spent the next few weeks conducting a thorough search of all the rooms. At the end of it. We both had 15 coins each. I gave anything that wasn't a coin to Kaza, I had no use for those. After we finished searching, Kaza began devoting herself to magic again. While we did spend time together, there was much less interaction between us. I didn't mind, I was finally able to put a dent in the pile of novels I was reading. Most of the novels I was reading were simple action novels. They had no real plot or character progression, but they were rather addicting to read. Kaza couldn't understand why I liked these novels so much. When I gave her my reasoning and suggested she pick one up for herself, she threw my suggestion back at me, telling me to read the romance novels she enjoys. I did have a lot of time on my hands, so I did take up her suggestion. To be honest, I was rather surprised. There was a good amount of character development and politics in most of them. I couldn't get through the romance though, I found it quite unbearable. Kaza had a similar opinion on my books. She enjoyed the characters getting stronger and the fast-paced battles, but couldn't continue when the main characters of these books started to challenge a god. No matter how hard each of us tried, we couldn't convince the other about the superior genre. Eventually, I went back to reading action novels, and she went back to reading romance novels in her spare time. To be honest, these days were the happiest days of my second life. I had no responsibilities, and could just spend my time lazing around. All good things eventually come to an end though. The next time we were given lunch, I was told that the banquet was right around the corner. And that meant my time here will soon come to an end. While I did think about staying here permanently, 
It was too isolated from the city. It would take me a long time to walk from here to the prison and back. A few days later, I was given a set of clothes to wear for the next day, and the next day, I began my walk back to the mansion. Announcement I'll be busy with studying for finals and trying to pass my classes for the next couple weeks. Chapter updates will be more erratic than usual, or they'll be shorter but more usual updates. 95 Chapter 16, Subversion of Tropes Announcement You expected a short chapter, but it was actually me, a long chapter. I wrote this a lot faster than expected. My brief life in this world always subverted the tropes I read about. I wasn't bullied by my siblings. Nor did I have a hidden talent for magic, I couldn't even find a hidden mentor to teach me martial arts. However, I expected the banquet to contain at least one trope, like a broken engagement, or the protagonist wolfing down as much food as he can, even if it didn't relate to me. Unfortunately, my expectations were not met. When I entered the banquet, everything seemed normal. As I scanned my surroundings, I saw some familiar faces. My mother who I hadn't seen much in the past few years, my siblings, and even that jade beauty I saw when I did my key potential test five years ago. Her green skin is slightly disturbing. I also saw some interesting faces. Perhaps the most interesting was a girl who was dressed in red. She had red hair and red eyes, with a red sword and red dress drinking red wine and red food. We made contact for a brief moment before I retracted my gaze and followed the butler to greet Marquis Venson. Marquis Venson was a tall man with an incredible white moustache. It was hard for me to recall any other features of his besides his large stature and moustache. I greeted Marquis Venson with a good amount of enthusiasm. He was my benefactor after all. I also greeted his family, including Finn's fiancé. It was hard for me to make a judgment on any of them. We hardly met for a few minutes. After some pleasantries with the Marquis family, I made my way back to the rundown hotel. When I arrived at the hotel, I was greeted by a grumpy Kaza. I was a bit surprised. I wondered what happened for her mood to be so sour. She usually never had an expression like this. I wanted to say something, but the tension in the atmosphere was thick. You could cut it with a knife. We only stared at each other in silence. After a few seconds, Kaza finally broke the silence. How many new friends did you make? I was pretty surprised at her question, but before I could say anything, she continued. I wonder how long you attended the party. I bet you attended for a long time right? She started sniffling if you've attended for a long time. I bet you made a lot of new friends right? Her sniffles started to turn into tears. If you made a lot of new friends, I bet you don't want to be my friend now. The tears started pouring out now I bet what you said about both of us only trusting each other was just a lie right? I bet you lied about everything, even not going to the prison years ago. To be honest, I was rather startled. How did she weave up such an intricate story? Rather than that, how did she connect it back to the prison? I wanted her to forget about that topic. After the initial wave of surprise, a sense of panic began to sink in. I didn't prepare for this. If I made the wrong move, then all the hard work I've put in for the past few years could end up being wasted. I knew I had to reply fast, and before I could even think, my mouth started moving. Why would I lie to you? We're brother and sister. Damn my mouth. I didn't know what I wanted to say, but I knew this wasn't it. As if on cue, Kaza screamed stop lying to me. We aren't really brother and sister and won't ever be. Fortunately, her outburst gave me a bit more time to think. With the way she's questioning me, she probably doesn't know how much time I spent at the banquet. Kaza, I didn't actually spend much time at the banquet, I just greeted Marquis Venson and left. I didn't have time to make friends. This seemed to calm her down a little, but she still teared up. I don't know how much time you spent in the banquet, I was so focused on learning a spell I didn't notice when you left. Even if you didn't spend much time at the banquet, I bet you could make a lot of friends fast. You even became friends with prisoners in a few days, how hard would anyone else be? How is she jumping to such crazy conclusions? I want to retort that she should be a storyteller rather than a mage, but this wasn't the time. I needed to figure out a way to convince Kaza that I didn't make friends outside. I mulled it over, she wasn't acting as composed as she did normally. I guess this outburst shows that she's still a child. This outburst was also incredibly irrational. I could tell that normal reasoning wasn't going to work. I had to fight fire with fire. 
irrationality with irrationality. I thought about telling her that I loved her for a quick second, but I quickly discarded that. I may not be the noblest person on this planet, but even I'm not low enough to tell an 11 year old I loved her as a 9 plus 20 year old. I decided on another approach. This approach will probably give me problems in the future, but the problem I'm facing right now is more important. You know as well as I do, the outside people are evil. I would never try to be friends with evil people like those. I wasn't sure if this would work, but this was the only thing I could think of. When I saw Kaza starting to return to normal, I knew it was close to working. You opened my eyes about the evil people in prison as well. There's no way I would never be your friend. In fact, you're the only nice person in the whole world, everyone else is evil. She slowly repeated the last phrase I said everyone else is evil. I decided to stop thinking about the future consequences and bit the bullet that's right, everyone besides us is evil, we can only trust each other. I don't think she heard me though, she just kept muttering everyone else is evil over and over again. It was, to be honest, quite scary, as I was wondering what to say, she suddenly stopped saying anything and stared at me. She then replied, with a smile that strangely widened eyes that were dilated. That's right, everyone else is evil. We can never trust them, we only have each other, and no one else. We're going to be together forever and ever, after I finish the academy we'll never be apart. Something was off about the statement. Something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what. From just the words alone, it seemed like a love confession, but I knew it wasn't that. Her words, tone, and facial expression didn't seem like someone who was in love. It seemed more like, obsession? It was hard to explain it. But I've seen this look in my past life, I've only seen it twice but I'd never forgotten it. The first time I saw it was when one of my friends told me about his desire for wealth, his tone was slightly different from Kaz's, but the atmosphere felt incredibly similar. The second time was when I saw an old documentary where a serial killer was describing his obsession with corpses. His atmosphere as he talked about dismembering the victims was eerily similar to Kaz's atmosphere right now but I was rendered even more confused when that atmosphere vanished in an instant. Kazu apologized for doubting me and left for the room, saying she wanted to sleep. As she left, I wondered if I just misjudged the atmosphere. After all, I was pretty nervous when talking to Kazu. Yeah, I was probably misjudging the atmosphere. 108. Chapter 17. Reality. Ding. You have awakened the magic martial arts system host. Compensating for 10 years of inactivity. 1 million skill points given. Level 5 mage, and level 4 martial artist are unlocked as compensation. Finally it happened. I have awoken my system. How long have I waited? About 10 years. This damn this better compensate me. System apologizes to host. System guarantees that it will help you to the best of its abilities from now onwards. In that case. Put everything into space magic until world hopping is unlocked. Then put the rest wherever you see fit system. Understood host. Finally, I'm done with this damn world. Magic is cool. But I miss the internet, modern food, television, and showers. I activated the space magic and a vortex to travel to another world formed. Goodbye world I won't miss I thought to myself as I entered the portal. And then, I woke up. In denial. I started saying system and status until my mouth became parched, but to no avail. I was still stuck in this world where I was as powerless as an ant. I swear I'll get revenge on whoever transmigrated me here. I swore to myself as I got ready. After I got ready I shifted my focus to more relevant topics. It's been a week since I returned to the mansion. Duke Bendel gave me my monetary reward, four big silver coins. The day after I returned in this world, there are five coins, copper, big copper, silver, big silver, gold, and platinum. Copper is the basic currency unit, 50 copper make a big copper, 2 big coppers make a silver, 50 silvers make a big silver coin, 2 big silvers make 1 gold coin, and 100 gold coins make a platinum coin. One big silver is usually enough for a regular commoner family of four to sustain themselves for three years. Although this amount might not be worth much for him. For me it's a small fortune. He also asked if I wanted to exchange getting taught by the instructor for coins. I accepted without hesitation. When I thought about it, everything that instructors would teach would be reliant on mana orc. If I wanted general training, such as survival training, I could just go to the adventurer guild 
which would be far cheaper. Duke Bendel gave me another big silver coin, and ten silvers, which he said would be the instructor's payment for about two years. After getting the money, I decided to hide it in several different places as a hedge against unexpected events. I kept five silver coins on me, I hid three big silver coins and five silver coins in my room and I buried the two other big silver coins in different places. I knew Duke Pendle had someone monitoring me, so I tried to pretend I was reading while digging the holes, hopefully, he or she didn't realize what I was doing. In addition to getting money, something else changed in my life. Kaza also acted differently. After the day of her outburst, she shut herself in her room studying magic, saying she wanted to leave the academy as fast as possible. This fervent studying was different than anything I've seen, when she studied before, she at least left her room for meals. If I didn't enter to give her meals she probably would have died of hunger. Even if I entered the room and put the meal down on a few books, she didn't even notice I was there. When this behavior persisted even after we returned to our respective residences, I could confirm that she became like this because of what I said to her that day. It's pretty obvious Kaza has attachment issues stemming from her treatment in this household. But that's all I can make out. I have no clue how to fix it, nor what the future entails. I did realize that I've changed something within her after that night, but I don't know how that change will affect me. After thinking about it for a few days, I decided to deal with it when I get there. I can't make plans for a future I have no idea about. At the very least. It looked like she was eating meals again. Another interesting byproduct of our stay was Kaz's quality of food was now on par to mine. On the other hand, I haven't gone out of the mansion in the past week. I've been debating what I should do with the money. I no longer need to visit the prison for entertainment, but I also didn't want to waste my money. After debating which restaurant or shop to visit, I made a decision. I'll visit a shop to buy a map. With that in mind, I left the mansion. 90. Chapter 18. Adventurer Guild. Announcement. The story hit 100 readers. Thank you all for reading this story. The books I learned geography from were made a few years before I was born. I was sure no major changes took place, but I was hesitant to trust the information blindly, which is why I needed a more recent map. I decided to visit the Adventurer Guild for a map because they would have more information regarding danger in the traveling routes. The Adventurer Guild also wouldn't supply inaccurate maps due to its reputation. The Adventurer Guild could be considered a subset of the army that is also independent. The country found that constantly forcing soldiers to defend against monsters as well as enemy countries tired the soldiers mentally and physically while costing the country a large amount of capital. To remedy the problem, the country decided to outsource the killing of monsters to civilians through the Adventurer Guild as adventurers. The guild also allowed citizens to post their requests that could be solved. This solution only worked for countries near monsters like Alvin. Other countries don't have the same volume or supply of monsters to sustain an adventurer guild. As such, the adventurer guild of Alvin could be considered part of the country itself, and would only sell genuine maps, albeit at a more expensive rate. The guild took longer to walk to than the prison but unlike the prison, People could be seen entering and exiting at all times. As I stood in line, people stared at me, but when they noticed I ignored them. Their attention shifted elsewhere. The interior of the guild was about what you would expect from a fantasy world. There was a bulletin board to the top far left corner of the first floor and in the bottom left corner, there was a place to create requests. The right entirely consisted of a small store that sold potions and information to the adventurers. To the front of the building was the meat of the adventurer guild, adventurers submitting requesting for completion. There was also a staircase that led to higher floors, which probably led to some adventurer training camps. The adventurer guild sold both fragments and complete maps in the shop. While the fragments didn't cost too much by themselves, purchasing a complete map was rather expensive, it cost two silver. The price was high because of how little demand there was for a complete map of Alvin and its nearby areas. The clerk looked at me strangely when I asked her for the map, but treated me professionally nonetheless. I asked her about survival training, but she told me I needed to wait till I was of age, so I finished the transaction and left the guild. I knew it was suspicious buying a map, but I felt buying it before I ran away would be more suspicious. Furthermore, Buying it right now would probably be considered curiosity before anything else. I took a look at the map once I returned to the mansion. Comparing it with the books I had, 
the maps were relatively similar. There were a few differences in boundary lines in the maps, and the adventurer map also included danger areas relative to adventurer rank. I realized when I read the map, but I forgot to ask about the adventurer ranks, but from what the map showed, a few ranks were copper, silver, and gold. After the comparison, I folded the map and hid it inside a book, and thought about what I was doing. I've just realized it, but with the money I have right now, it wouldn't be difficult to bribe someone to take me to a different country. What I'm worried about was the Duke forcing me to come back, but would he spend that much effort on someone like myself? I thought about it for an hour and decided that bribing someone wouldn't be worth the risk, if I failed I'd suffer for the rest of my life. Still, it's not like running away by myself didn't have any risks. If I met most kinds of monsters, I would instantly be dead, and nothing can change that. It was a risk I decided to take. Living here makes me a subject to the Duke's whims. For example, if he one day decided to pawn me off in a political marriage, I'd have no choice but to accept. The thought makes me shudder. It's now time for me to decide what I should do with my remaining money. I originally thought of visiting shops for entertainment, but I neglected just how little entertainment existed. The only forms of entertainment were acting troops, reading books, and various forms of gambling. I already read books and I dislike acting troops. Regarding gambling, let's just say I would be in debt in a week. Looks like my only form of entertainment is going to be talking to the prisoners. I thought to myself as I was eating my dinner. I didn't dislike the prisoners, I just wanted to add something new to my repertoire. I wanted to visit the other prison, but I didn't know its location, and I bet they wouldn't let me enter that prison anyways. The people in that prison were at a different level altogether. I finished my meal and I realized the perfect solution, I could ask the prisoners what to do for fun. The next day, I went to the prison and asked the prisoners what I should do for fun, they wanted to ask me about the engagement party I attended, but my question ended up sparking a debate amongst them. When I told them I disliked gambling, hated troops, and got bored of reading, they felt stumped and viewed my statement as a challenge. It took them a while. But they came up with a genuine answer, participate in auctions. I completely forgot about auctions, they were perfect. I could enter any common auction house I wanted with my status, and I could watch other people bid for entertainment I didn't need to waste any money. The prisoners went one step further than a common auction. They recommended I attend an underground auction, in their words, as long as you hide your face, shut up, and don't buy anything, no one will care about you. A few of them even told me about an upcoming underground auction. They didn't just tell me about it. They started coaching me about what I should do at the auction. Honestly, I was going to refuse them. But the more they talk the more interesting it sounds. An auction of questionable items. With questionable people. Perhaps I could even encounter the trope of people being attacked outside of an auction. I've always wanted to go to an underground auction. Perhaps this is the right time. I know Duke Pendle has someone following me, but I'm simply attending an auction, not doing anything illegal. The next few days, I brought the prisoners twice the amount of food I usually did, and they instructed me on what to do. I bought a mask, a cloak, and memorized the auction location and password. On the day of the auction, I brought two big silvers with me. I know I said that I wasn't going to bid, but what if I did want to bid, for safekeeping? I hid one coin in my shoe and carried one with me. As I approached the venue, I had trouble calming my heart down. This was the first time since Taurus gave me tracking that I was this excited. 91. Chapter 19. Auction. The auction was hosted by the Information Guild, unlike the information the Adventurer Guild sells, which is mainly about monster patterns and changes in traveling routes. The Information Guild sells information on anything as long as they get paid. This causes the Information Guild to be a grey area in the city, where criminals and officials are treated equally. People who hosted auctions used the Information Guild as a venue because they can get more potential bidders, and because no one will fight because it risked being banned by the Guild. The Information Guild likes auctions because they make a profit on renting the venue, and a commission on goods sold. The auction I'm attending is selling an abnormal amount of grimoires, magic books, and martial arts manuals. When people heard the news, they tried to make money as fast as possible to fund their auction budget. Although these manuals were expensive, they hoped that a large number of manuals meant they could buy one. 
The items sold in the auction are usually incredibly hard to find, so they wanted to take a chance. Apparently, there was an influx in prisoners caused by the auction. The prisoner who gave me her invitation said she would rather see someone use an invitation rather than waste it in the jail. I arrived at the information guild and gave the required information to join the auction. A unique password, which the prisoner gave me and proof of wealth. One big silver was enough to join the auction. I was surprised when I entered the venue. It looked like an opera room. As soon as I entered, I saw a theater-like stage at the back of the room to present the items. I also saw two separate floors. The top floor for VIPs and the bottom for regular auction attendees. The VIP floor was separated by room. Each room had a closed space and open space while the bottom floor had everyone grouped together in seats. There were three clusters of seats located in the right, left, and center of the room respectively, with enough space for two people to pass between any cluster. I took a seat in an edge seat on the left cluster and waited for the auction to start. I was neither early nor late for the auction. People were already seated but there were still people coming in. Everyone wore masks but some had more interesting masks than others. A person on the VIP floor had a red mask with red hair, while another wore a mask with a blue nose and wings on the side. I accidentally made eye contact with the VIP who had a red mask. I could see their eyes, which were as red as blood. I recognized those eyes. It was that girl I made eye contact with at the banquet. The fact she was in a VIP room and a nobles party meant she was a big shot. Hopefully, she doesn't care about me. Getting involved with big shots is a death sentence for me. Sometime later, the seats were packed to the brim, and the auction began. The auctioneers announced that the auction for items that weren't martial arts manuals and grimoires will begin first. The first few items they announced were a few weapons and staff. There were a few bidding wars, but people generally kept their money saved. Next, the auctioneer said to take a small break as they needed to prepare the next set of items. On the break I started to doze off. But before I could fall asleep, I was approached by someone who looked like a guard. He had a magician's robe on but his affiliation wasn't with the auction. The guard asked me to come with him. And I didn't refuse. I could surmise what this was about. As expected, he took me to the room of the red-haired girl. The VIP rooms were surprisingly simple. There was a table with seats and refreshments, and a couch as furniture in the room. There were a few paintings on the walls, but I had no clue about their worth. I followed the guard's instructions and took a seat across from the girl. Only after he returned to her side and whispered something to the girl did she start speaking. She tapped her fingers on the table. You are Auric, Duke Pendle's son. You can take off the mask, there is no need for these between nobles. So she was a noble. With eyes like that I bet she was the subject of many rumors. Wait a minute, red hair, eyes the color of blood, likes the color red in general, and is a noble? Isn't this, the blood princess? As I took off my mask, I realized I had no clue how to approach this. All I knew about Ailsa, the blood princess, was from the rumors the prisoners told me. She was four years older than me, and had talent that could rival Kaza's talent. However, unlike Kaza, who had incredible talent as a magician, she had average talent as a magician and incredible talent as a warrior. She was called the Blood Princess due to her red eyes and pure bloodline that resulted in her warrior talent. Her nickname took on a different meaning two years ago when she started hunting down monsters in the name of justice. She enjoyed hunting down monsters to the point where the Adventurer Guild requested her to stop hunting low-class monsters so other adventurers could make a living. When she was unable to hunt monsters of her level, she started hunting down criminals with her guards. Her sense of justice and attitude made her loved among the military but made nobles afraid of her. I echoed the sentiment of the nobles, anyone would be hesitant when a princess like that talks to you. Although she was being pursued by a few nobles of different countries, the king wanted to keep her talents within the country, giving him a difficult problem to solve. As I was thinking about what I should say, I heard the tapping intensify. I decided to break the ice and greeted her. Hello Princess Ailsa. To what may I owe this pleasure? The tapping sound increased in speed, cease the formalities. What is your purpose for coming here? My purpose? A child under ten, incapable in both magic and kick who is friends with prisoners, managed to gain access to an auction that will be selling grimoires and martial arts manuals. Who sent you here to buy what? No wonder the nobles were afraid of her. This personality is scary. Before I could say anything, she continued. If you confess, 
I promise you will not be punished harshly. I wondered what I should say so that I can end this farce. I decided to just tell her the truth and hope for the best. I was attending the auction for entertainment. I planned to leave before the main items were being auctioned. This was true, the prisoners told me not to stick around for the books because the auction would increase in danger. It didn't seem like the princess agreed with me, she slammed her hand on the table and spoke with a lower tone, refusing to answer me. Savan, take him out of here and put him in jail for major criminals. He'll talk just like all the other nobles did. I was speechless, she did this to other people as well. No wonder they feared her, she's a tyrant. However, I wasn't worried. This was the information guild, and I was sure that they would prevent people from being outright arrested here. At least, that was what I thought till the guard named Savan held onto me, and teleported us out of the guild. By the time I realized what happened, I was already being taken to jail. Sensing my confusion, Savan explained it was a space mage spell called Blink. The information guild won't help you, as long as you follow me I promise not to hurt you. I didn't really have a choice. So I just followed him to jail. When we arrived at the jail, I couldn't help but ask, Are you really sending me to jail? If I confess now would you let me go? He just tryly smiled and said sorry. Princess's orders, I also wouldn't recommend confessing right now. The last time that happened. Well that poor kid is still in jail. I would advise you to lay low and wait for your family to bail you out. Would they really bail me out? I'm sorry I recognized you. If you're really sorry. Hold on to my big silvers and return then when I'm acquitted. I handed him the two big silvers I brought with me. You aren't mad at me? Did you imprison me? Ha ha. You're a good kid. I'll try my best to help you out. Although he said that. He still handed me over to the prison wardens. I did say I wanted to visit this prison in the past. But I didn't mean from the inside. 87. Chapter 20. A fuss. Announcement. Elsu age change. 13 years old greater than 14 years old. Elsa Poff. My father told my siblings and me that Alvin is standing on pillars of sand. Although the empire appears sturdy at the moment, without those pillars of sand becoming stone, it would crumble. The only way to transform the sand pillars was to reform the empire. In the future, this responsibility will rest on you, my children. Most of what my father said was right, but I disagreed on one point. As a princess of the Alvin Empire, I couldn't wait till I was older to reform the empire, I had to act now. I first tried killing monsters, then tried apprehending criminals, but my actions had a negligible effect on the overall state of the empire. When I asked my father why my actions had little impact, he stroked my hair and replied in a gentle tone Nailsa, you cannot eliminate a tree by cutting its leaves. I knew what he meant, to reform the empire, I had to deal with corrupt nobles. However, I could not touch nobles themselves, I was young and had little influence. Instead, I decided to focus on the nobles' children. Utilizing the royal intelligence networks and my guards, I created a list of people who would become a detriment to Alvin in the future. However, I believed that a person could be reformed before reaching a certain point. I took it upon myself to reform these future nobles. My methods differed depending on their personalities. For some I humiliated them, others I created fear towards me, and some I threw into prison, hoping the experience would shock them. People accused me. They called me a tyrant for abusing their children with no evidence. It didn't matter to me if I they called me a tyrant. My actions wouldn't change. I would do anything to reform Alvin. As my father said, the ends justify the means. I'm sure if my mother was alive, she would be happy with my actions. Her last wish for me was to become a great princess. When I went to Duke Pendle's residence for his son's engagement party, I knew it was an opportune time to deal with a high priority target, Rorik Pendle. That person was a blemish on the Honorable Duke Pendle's reputation. He had no talent and was a companion of criminals. He didn't show any behavior of becoming a potential criminal, but I still marked him as a high priority target. I believe that it is not possible for someone who only talks to criminals to not have a future as a criminal. I knew that if his path wasn't corrected, it had the potential to cause catastrophic damage to the empire. It's truly a shame I only saw him briefly at the dinner party before he vanished. No matter how much I questioned Duke Pendle, his response was the same. Rorik was studying for a career as a military advisor. We both knew it was a lie but I knew it would be rude to the Duke if I was to inquire further. 
I was frustrated. I can't let such a high priority target escape my grasp. I decided to stay in the city a little longer and wait for an opportune moment. However, my attention shifted when I heard the news of the Information Guild hosting an auction. The guards I had around the royal capital would not permit me to attend these sorts of grey auctions, but the guards I had with me right now were from my father's guards. These people would listen to me unless my actions threatened my life. When I told them I wanted to attend, they made the arrangements. It was truly a coincidence that I managed to see my target, Rorik Pendle, attending the auction. I knew it was him without even meeting his eyes. Perhaps he was the only person who could attend an auction like this without Kilmana. This was the perfect time for me to execute my plan. I told Savin to confirm that it was Rorik and if he did confirm, to bring him to my room. Thankfully, I wasn't wrong. And I found myself face to face with the child who was friends with criminals. I had already thought of the simplest way to bring him on the right path. If he learned the true depravity of criminals, he would naturally stop associating with them. So, I accused him. I accused him of attending this auction to transport manuals to criminal organizations. I knew it wasn't true. If someone like him bid on a manual, he would be killed as he left the auction. He probably did visit the auction to entertain himself as he said. But it didn't matter, all I needed was an excuse. I told Savin to throw him into the major prison in this area. It might seem extreme to some, but this was the perfect solution to cure his problems. When he begs the wardens for mercy, realizing his mistakes, I'll let him leave the prison. Until then, he will remain there. I felt no pity for him. If he wanted my pity, he shouldn't have associated with criminal scum. However, I do feel embarrassed at that farce. Anyone could tell that it was simply an abuse of my power. However, I will do anything and everything I can to achieve my goal. Because I am a royal of Alvin and it is my duty. As long as I fulfilled my duty I would be a great princess. 85. Chapter 21. Subversion of Tropes. 2. The wardens were rather confused, but they didn't dare question the authority of a royal family. At the same time, they didn't know how to treat me. The reason they were confused was that although I was brought in to be imprisoned, I didn't look the part of a captured criminal. Savin also began talking to the wardens and told them to treat me well and prevent harm from befalling me. As he continued to talk, he implied that my imprisonment was a result of one of the blood princess's whims and that I had committed no crimes. When Savin finished his sermon and left, the wardens began discussing what to do with me. Despite my circumstances, I was still a pendle. The Pendle family might me to be scorned silently, but they wouldn't allow someone to take direct action against me. It would damage the Pendle's reputation if the Duke's son was mistreated unjustly in their territory, especially by those who were employed by them. However, if they didn't treat me like a prisoner, they would antagonize the Blood Princess. They were essentially discussing who to piss off, a Duke or a crazy princess. Pissing off the princess might be an obvious choice. But they were probably afraid that with her personality, she would order their execution once she learned the truth. At the same time, if they pissed off the Duke they could live a life worse than death. I didn't pity their position. I wasn't worried about becoming trapped in prison, I knew I would be out in a week or two at maximum. Duke Bendel did place, someone, to monitor my movements. I'm sure that Spy has already told him about my situation. He'll probably get the king to give him some benefit for imprisoning his son. If I'm fortunate I might get a decent reward. Honestly, the reason I was getting nervous was because of Kaza. She definitely dislikes prisoners, and I'm fairly certain that I accidentally convinced her during her outburst that the prisoners were all evil without question. What if she finds out I'm a prisoner? I didn't want to deal with it. I'm confused about how to deal with her already. Complicating it would cause me to take make a wrong decision. A wrong decision could cause her dependence on our relation to turn into something similar to, in the worst case, obsession. Just the very thought scared me. As I was pondering the future, a warden turned and asked me what I did for entertainment. I replied that I read books, and he went back to discuss what I said. After a few more minutes of their discussion, the same warden told me to take a seat and wait for them to finish preparations. He handed me a book he was reading so I could pass the time. His book was similar to the novels I read, a story about a man taking on the world with his fists. If there was anything different, it was a bit more risky than my usual tastes. I was one-thirds through the novel when that warden asked me to follow him. As we walked, he said in a voice drenched in nervousness, 
I'll take you to your new residency for the next few days. We've moved things around and hope it will be to your liking. When all he heard from me was the sound of my footsteps, he gulped and continued. Due to the circumstances, we have to imprison you. He stopped speaking when I stared at him. The warden swallowed his saliva before continuing, if you have any demands. We'll listen to them all. When I heard what he said, I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from smiling. Since they gave me an inch I'll take a mile. I want the keys to my room. I also want meals delivered to me three times a day from a nearby restaurant. Lastly, give me the files on all the current prisoners here. The warden was dumbfounded when he heard my words. He was about to say something but I interjected. My name is Rorik Pendle. Understand your position and fulfill my demands. I can't guarantee what happens if you don't. There was no need for me to act like a child right now. The wardens were trying to imprison me until the princess left to avoid anger from both parties. They hoped I would tell Duke Pendle that they treated me comfortably. If I did, instead of being punished, they would be rewarded. Since the wardens chose to take this course of action they could only agree to my demands. Sure enough. A few seconds later he ended up agreeing to my requests. As we continued walking to my cell, I started focusing on the prisoners' reactions, which were quite amusing. Hey look, Kelton is bringing in a new prisoner. Doesn't that prison look like a child? Also, why does he have no shackles? You fools, I recognize him. He's the son of the Pendle family who can't use mana or kick. Are you meant Rorik Pendle? From a friend I know he visits the other prison. Maybe he's here to entertain us. No look. Kelton put him in the middle of the three cells that were just vacated. When they saw the warden, Kelton, lock me up and leave. They burst into an uproar. Many of them were wondering what exactly caused a duke's son to be imprisoned in jail for dangerous criminals. Their confusion only intensified when they saw the other wardens bringing me items such as pillows and books. A few of them even thought that I decided to live in a prison. Just when the prisoners' thoughts were getting more ridiculous, a loud voice silenced them. You fools. Isn't it obvious why he's here? How did I get stuck in a jail with imbeciles like you? I'll explain it in a way that you lot can understand. He doesn't want to live here, but he'll be staying here for a couple of weeks. He's not a prisoner, so they're giving him amenities we don't have access to, and he's going to be gone in a few weeks so he didn't move into this prison. He probably pissed off someone. When the prisoners heard this person's voice and statement, they started settling down. I was surprised. Whoever said that got the general idea of the story. I tried locating the person behind the voice, but it was impossible inside my cell. No matter, I'll ask Kelton later. I thought to myself as I looked. Speaking of Kelton, it looks like he told the other wardens my demands. The last few items to arrive in my cell were a stack of documents detailing the prisoners, my jail cell key, and dinner that I presumed was from a nearby restaurant. The reason I wanted the papers and the ability to move around freely was simple, I was going to try and get a new soul technique. I wanted to come here before, but I was a bit worried about how I was going to accomplish my plans here. I never expected such a golden opportunity to fall into my lap. I need to thank that tyrant princess when I get the chance. As I thought of the tyrant princess, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. That dumb girl. What did she think was going to happen if a noble was thrown into prison by someone like her? The other noble children who got thrown into prison were probably treated better than I am right now. What an idiot. Still, I shouldn't make too much fun of her, she's essentially my benefactor at this point. In fact, I should be nice to her. Yeah, I should be nice to her as thanks for this opportunity. The next time I meet her I'll make her compensate me with a few gold coins instead of big silver coins. I thought to myself as I turned the pages on the prisoner portfolios. 94. Chapter 22. Searching. The opportunity the tyrant princess gave me would last a maximum of a month, and a minimum of a week to find a new soul technique. To prepare for the worst, I planned on leaving the jail in a week. It seemed unrealistic to find one in a week, given it took me a few years to find my first. But it took me a few years before I thought about bribing prisoners with food. I'm still a little embarrassed thinking about that. In addition, I have the prisoners' records this time around. I spent my first few days examining the current prisoner records. I wasn't looking for anything specific. If it was that easy to figure out who possessed soul techniques, Taurus wouldn't have been rotting in jail. 
Instead, I was aiming at the weaker demographic of prisoners. I hypothesized that if everyone in here is imprisoned for similar crimes, weaker criminals would be more likely to have a trump card that doesn't use mana or key than stronger criminals. I could be completely wrong but I don't have the time to visit all the prisoners. There were also a few other minor reasons. I believed it would be easier to converse with a weaker prisoner than a stronger prisoner, and I didn't want to associate too much with strong prisoners. As I was skimming through the records, I separated the mages and the martial artists because I couldn't compare how strong they were compared to each other. Next, I separated those two groups by the level of strength written in their records. While I was separating them, I tallied how many people were in each tier of strength. The most glaring flaw in my simple analysis was that I was unable to compare the strength of magicians and martial artists skewing my statistic. I decided to accept those flaws and move to the next step of my plan. I took the records of the weaker people and began analyzing them. My goal was to eliminate outliers so I didn't waste time talking to them. An example of an outlier would be a prisoner who swindled money from nobles. He's an outlier for me because he isn't the kind of criminal I'm looking for. After that sorting, I sorted by how many years the prisoners have left before they leave the prison. I didn't want to talk to people with less than three years left, because they wouldn't want to risk their freedom. I also eliminated people who shared a room. It would be harder to talk about trump cards with other people nearby. Once I finished removing the outliers, I had 10 magicians and 32 martial artists who were potential candidates. I was satisfied with 42 people to question. If I did 10 people a day, I could finish within the worst case time scenario. Instead of approaching the criminals indirectly, I decided to ask directly ask them about their secrets. I wouldn't specify what exactly I wanted. I would just ask them to give me their secret for food. I hoped they would be desperate enough to taste decent food after staying here. I thought about utilizing one of Tracking's flaws. People who can use soul essence would recognize someone as using a soul technique, but I deemed it too risky. This prison was about 2.5x bigger than the other prison and had much tighter security. What if they had a way to detect soul techniques? With these thoughts in mind, I left my cell and looked for Kelton. He had essentially become my go for these last two days, he delivered whatever I needed at any time. He was probably surprised to see me out of my cell. When Kelton heard me asking for fruits, he agreed without much hesitation. But when I asked for alcohol, he started to hesitate. I thought there might have been laws regarding the minimum age for alcohol consumption, but he said it wasn't allowed for prisoners to consume alcohol. It took one sentence to convince him to give me the alcohol. Stop talking nonsense. A few minutes later he handed me the fruits and five bottles of alcohol. Seeing how fast he brought them to me, I realized the reason he tried to not hand me the alcohol. I randomly picked two people to approach today as a test run. One murdered his colleague for a treasure, and the other assassinated a warrior one level higher than himself. I approached Swain, assassin first. He was in the prison for four years and had five more years in his sentence. I first asked the nearby guards to leave the area. I used the excuse of being intimidated by them to make them leave. When I arrived at his cell, I handed him a piece of paper and a pen. I took out another piece of paper and pen for myself and started writing. Let's talk through writing. Write down yes on your paper if you agree. He looked at me confused before writing down. Okay, we began a small conversation through writing. Do you want fruits? No. How about alcohol? You have alcohol? If you want it I need something from you. What do you need? You assassinated a warrior, stronger than yourself. I want what allowed you to kill him. I killed him when he let his guard down. I didn't do anything special. I know you're lying. I won't tell anyone. I want it for myself. I didn't know if he was lying. But that didn't matter. Are you really a child? This might be your only chance to get alcohol this decade. If you answer me, I'll give you two bottles. Minus three bottles. Okay. Have you heard of cursed weapons? I haven't heard much. Explain. I don't know much about how they're made. All I know is that they can give you power beyond your limits in exchange for something. In my case, my weapon desired positive emotions. It would give you power in exchange for taking those emotions for a period of time. Where is the cursed weapon now? It's gone. It was taken from me when I was caught. Why wasn't this written in the records? Cursed weapons sell for a high price on the black market. Do we still have a deal? Although this conversation was useless, I was a man of my word. Hand me the paper and pencil and I'll give them to you. 
It's not my responsibility if the guards take it after I leave. Before he handed me the paper and pencil, he wrote down, Don't use cursed weapons. I regret sacrificing my emotions. You may be powerless but at least you're still a complete human. I didn't reply to his statement. I handed him his fruits and alcohol and left. Although I made a loss on this prisoner, my strategy seems to work. As I walked to the next prisoner's cell, I hoped his information would be more useful for me. 92. Chapter 23. Searching. 2. Announcement. Interesting milestone. The last chapter made this web novel have more views than its word count. It's my sixth day searching for soul technique. I've finished searching through the original 42 people I marked and have expanded my search criteria. Unfortunately, I haven't had any results so far. But I have learned a few things. Cursed weapons probably aren't as rare as I first imagined. The police like to sell cursed weapons. It's a little surprising that over 80% of the people I asked used some form of a cursed weapon, but I suppose that was the result of picking a specific demographic. The other 20% had some sort of technique that permanently damaged them in exchange for immediate power. To get a different result, I decided to start focusing on people who had average strength in this prison. Interestingly, the races that had average strength were more diverse than races that had below average strength. Below average strength consisted of mostly humans, while there was a good mix of elves and BS folk who had average strength. I haven't had much interaction with other races. Alvin didn't discriminate between races, I just never had much of an opportunity. After interacting with some of the other races, I was a bit disappointed at how little my fantasy knowledge from my past life carries over. I thought I would find Beast folk and elves attractive, but honestly, I found them slightly repulsive. Elves with their signature long ears looked strange, while Beast folk looked outright creepy blending features between humans and animals. I'm surprised there isn't any discrimination between races. I asked Kelton and he told me people don't mind the appearances of elves and beast folk, so I wondered why I disliked it. Maybe it's because I come from another world? I had no time to answer my question as my priority was getting a soul technique. As I've been asking criminals, I've also had to adjust the bribes I give. After the tenth person, I stopped using alcohol because I felt bad looking at Kelton's expression handing me the tenth bottle of his alcohol. I still got results with fruits but it took considerably longer without using alcohol. At this point, I getting fairly frustrated. The wardens had started to take notice of my actions, and I was still shooting in the dark. If I was picked up from the jail without getting something, I would be kicking myself. I knew I needed better information, and the only way to get information would be to ask someone. There were only two types of people I could ask, a prisoner or a warden. A warden was out of the question. It was practically suicide. My only option was to ask a prisoner, but that would mean revealing my intentions to a third party. I couldn't control what the third party would do with my information, which was dangerous for my future. I couldn't even guarantee that information could give me a soul technique, it would only give me a higher probability of finding one. Furthermore, it's not like this is my only opportunity to get a soul technique. I still have at least half a decade before I run away. I was calculating whether this was a risk that was worth taking. Eventually, I made a decision. This was my second shot at life, it would be pointless to not take risks in it. Who knows, I could even a third shot at life if this one doesn't work out. Luckily for me, the prison records had brief descriptions of what the prisoners were doing in the prison. There were quite a few prisoners who traded some of their food for stories of other prisoners, asking one of them should give me a lead. After some debating. I chose to visit one of the stronger people in this prison, an elf named Gruz. There wasn't much written about his past, and the only thing written about his personality was he liked interesting things. Regarding his crimes, they weren't anything special. I decided to approach his cell when the guards were the least active, the night. As I walked to his cell while dismissing the wandering guards, I couldn't help but lightly tap my leg in nervousness. By the time I reached his cell, I started internally humming a melody to the beat of my finger. Gruz was an elf with no distinct characteristics. If I was to name a unique feature about him, it would be his long pointy ears. If he didn't have ceiling shackles on him I would have thought that he wasn't a prisoner. When he saw me approaching his cell he started to stare at me. Even after I handed him the pen and paper he continued to stare. 
He finally looked at his pen and paper after I wrote down that we will communicate through writing. I started writing. I didn't want to ask specifically for soul techniques, but I wanted to imply I wanted one. Hello Graz, I wanted to buy information. He gestured for me to stop and started writing. You want to grow stronger right? People who talked to you said you asked them how to get stronger, but you wouldn't approach that many criminals to grow stronger the regular way. You want some kind of forbidden technique. I was surprised, he was the only person who recognized that I wanted a forbidden technique. Others who I approached thought I wanted a special method to form my phylactery or dantian, or thought I wanted a weapon. Instead of replying, I nodded at Graz. I have a longer lifespan than your race and I am more curious towards the forbidden than a common elf. Your situation is incredibly unusual, even I have only seen a few cases like yours. I do know of a technique that you can use, but it's one of the worst taboos of your kind. I believe they call it soul magic, are you interested? I realized he had complete control of the flow of the conversation, however, I still nodded. The question is what you can do for me. This time in jail is but a fleeting moment in my long life. I have no need for your food. At the same time, the only thing you can give me besides food is a favor, is that correct? He stopped writing and took a look at me. Before I could respond he looked down again and began writing. Then, in exchange for this forbidden magic, you shall take a locket that belongs to me from the wardens, take that locket and bury it in the most beautiful scenery you can find. Don't ask any questions and just bury it. That's all I ask. I was being played here. I don't know what the locket does, but it's definitely nothing good. The smart choice would be to avoid this transaction altogether or to throw the locket away after I get the technique. However, I was greedy enough to take the risk, and I refuse to renege on a deal once it's made, barring extraordinary circumstances. It goes against my principles. He could be lying to me, but considering he needs me to do a task for him he probably wouldn't lie. So I agreed and gave him a few more sheets of paper. After he finished writing it down, he handed me the sheets of paper and told me how his locket looks. I almost ran back to my cell while avoiding any conversations. In my cell, I pretended like I was reading a book, but I was reading the pages Gruz had written for me instead. I was looking forward to reading about my new soul technique. 93. Chapter 24. As. Announcement. If you have any thoughts or suggestions about the new soul technique leave a comment, also answer the poll if you have an opinion. Gruz had written five pages of notes for an augmentation type soul technique called as. It used soul essence to reinforce one's body in a similar way to kick. There were three steps to as. The first was to circulate the soul essence within my soul in a specific way and form soul veins. The next was to use those soul veins to reinforce parts of your body. I came up with the name soul veins myself because soul veins functioned similarly to regular veins. The only difference was that it transported soul essence. The last step was the strangest. It was to use another type of circulation to replenish soul essence. However, the concept of equivalent exchange exists in this world. It was impossible to create soul essence without using something in exchange. The third step of as converted blood into soul essence. A benefit of the third step is that it can be used without using as. He wrote down that the amount of essence created through blood would increase as one became adept at the circulation. The more I looked at it, the more it resembled how the heart works. The soul was the heart. It transported essence through soul veins and the nutrients for the soul to produce essence was blood. I was curious about who created as, more specifically. I wondered which madman thought to use blood as a supplement and how did they live long enough to develop the technique, as if he predicted what I would think. Graz wrote that he did not know the creator. Graz had written more than I thought he would. As was only about two of the five pages he wrote. The rest was his experiences with As. I could feel his sincerity in our deal because he probably wrote everything he thought would be useful. Gruz wrote that after a few years, he could get As to strengthen the body to the level of a tier 5 martial artist. He also wrote that if you focused one's essence on one part of the body, it would resemble a tier 7 martial artist for one strike. He said that for him, As was useful in life or death scenarios where he ran out of mana. However, he also stated that he couldn't use as at full force for more than a couple of hours without losing too much blood. However, he stated that he could use as to the strength of a tier 2 martial artist for a few days without much loss of blood. In addition, he about some problems with as. 
The most interesting problem he wrote about was a sense of discomfort when he practiced and used the technique. I thought it was interesting because he used the technique for years but the sense of discomfort never left. There were some bigger problems, but they were farther along the road. Despite its problems, as was truly an incredible soul technique. To be able to exert the power of a dear five martial artist, even if only for a small amount of time, without any kiss incredible. Furthermore, as augmented the body, so it could be used in attack or defense. I could probably travel by myself using tracking and as. Maybe I could even be an adventurer. I put away those thoughts and started practicing as. Almost an hour into my practice and I was confused by what Gruz meant when he wrote I would feel a sense of discomfort. He wrote that at the start of the first step I would feel an extreme sense of discomfort that would cause me to stop practicing. However, I felt no discomfort, I actually felt a pleasant sensation when I started the circulation, like when eating a good fruit. I wondered if I was practicing wrong, but I didn't feel like anything was wrong. At the same time, I wondered if he lied to me. But there would be no point lying about something like this after writing five pages. I thought about visiting him again but I didn't want to owe him another favor, I would bury this locket and never see him again. I eventually chalked it up to the differences between a human and an elf. I didn't want to discard Gruz's notes just yet, so I hid them while I practiced. However, I didn't just practice, I also visited prisoners like before. I didn't want to draw suspicion to the meeting between Gruz and me. After three days, Someone from the Pendle Mansion came to pick me up. It was time to return to the mansion. As I was leaving the prison, I could see the after effects of my actions. Some of the wardens were almost dancing in joy, others were looked at me with a look that screamed, Don't come here again. On the other hand, the prisoners were a little disappointed to see me go. They wouldn't get someone to visit them as I did. I probably won't be visiting this prison again as was more than enough for my plans. I also didn't enjoy talking to these prisoners as much. Unlike the prisoners in the other prison, these prisoners were genuine criminals, some were murderers, some scammed millions, and some were terrorists. Talking to most of them left me with a sense of uneasiness. The person who took me back to the Duke's mansion was a butler I've seen a few times already, the one by the Duke's side. He took me back via carriage, and throughout the journey, we didn't speak. I spent my time staring out the window and wondering where I should bury Gruz's locket. He showed me sincerity in our deal so I needed to bury this in an area with beautiful scenery. I had a few places in mind, but it was hard to narrow it down to a specific location. The time on the carriage wasn't enough to single out a specific location. I didn't have to bury the locket immediately so I decided to think about it later. For now, the butler was guiding me to the Duke's study. I wasn't too worried about the meeting with Duke Pendle, I knew he wasn't going to harm me right now. Instead, I was wondering what reward I would get for living in the prison for a few days. Gruz Baxter? Yes. No. Total voters. 201. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Gruz Baxter? 80. Chapter 25. Reunion. Once we went into the study, the butler went back to Duke Pendle's side. The duke started tapping on his desk and began speaking. The king wishes to apologize for this misunderstanding. I hope you won't take the princess's actions to heart. She does what she thinks is best for the empire. There's no need for apologies. My actions are misunderstandable. Since you understand, this matter can end here. The princess has returned to the capital and won't be able to give you a direct apology at this time. You are dismissed. I turned my heels and walked away. Once I entered my room. I couldn't help but sigh in sadness. There was no reward after all. I hoped I could have gotten a useful tool like a subspace bag, but I'm not disappointed. If I wasn't the son of a duke who knows how long I would be in there. However, what infuriated me the most were my two big silvers. That bastard Savin said he'd give them back to me. I thought he would give it to the duke for safekeeping but he ended up pocketing them. I thought he was a good guy as well. I need to start second-guessing my judgment of people. Although there was bad news, there was also good news. Judging by how I didn't see Kaza, she probably didn't leave her room for the past week. I wondered what she's been doing for so long. The last time this situation occurred was when she advanced from Tier 1 to Tier 2, but there's no way she's trying to advance to Tier 3. The Academy Kaza will attend her Tier 4 as a qualification to graduate from the Mage Department. To get to Tier 3 one year before the official enrollment date of the Academy. 
That's a little too ridiculous, right? Well, whatever the case is, I'll find out soon. I told myself as I started to think of other tasks. I have two main tasks, finding a place to bury Graz's locket, and mastering as. Since he wants it to be buried in a nice area, I decided to explore the foresty area around that rundown hotel I lived in. I could probably find a clearing to bury it in. I didn't put too much thought into burying it in the Pendle property. I was planning on running away before Graz got released. Regarding as, I managed to smuggle Graz's notes out without being caught. I don't wish to talk about where it was hidden though. Now, all I need to do is practice it. I didn't feel like visiting any prisons at the moment. I lived in one just a few hours ago. The next couple of weeks, I spent my time visiting the forest and practicing as I found a few clearings in the forest, but none of them had decent scenery. Gruss showed his sincerity and I wanted to show mine as well. On the other hand, I made some progress with as but nothing noticeable. I didn't particularly mind my slow progress. This was more complicated than tracking and I wanted to take my time understanding it. I was about to continue on my usual visit to the forest but an unexpectedly expected variable, Kaza entered my room. I was a bit surprised, usually, she knocked on the door. Unlike her usual stoic self, she was bursting with excitement. Rorik, Rorik guess what I just did? Did you learn a new spell? Even better, I became a tier 3 magician, aren't I amazing? Wow, that's incredible. I was happy for her and surprised at how fast her progress was. I decided to ask her about it. How did you go from tier 2 to tier 3 so quickly? I thought you might ask that. It's because of our talk that night. I knew what talk she was referring to. It was her relief outburst after I came back from the party that day. But that raised another question. Just what was she referring to? If I recall, the only thing I told her something along the line of we can only trust each other. How did that cause her to get stronger? Kaza, how did that talk make you stronger? I'm not surprised you don't understand. I'll explain it to you. We can only trust each other, but what happens if one day, there's a war or even worse, a beast tied? We would have to trust other people for our safety if I'm weak. So I just have to be strong and that problem is solved. She exclaimed triumphantly. I wasn't too sure how she came up with it, nor did I really want to question her logic. If it made her stronger then who am I to criticize it? However, I did want to talk to her about the concept of only we can trust each other. I was worried that it would cause some sort of incident in the academy, causing damage to her prestige. As someone who was going to rely on her prestige, I wanted to remove any incidents that have the potential to damage it. I do realize it was entirely my fault she began this thought, so I needed to be the one to correct it. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. But Kaza, I think it's okay to trust other people. Not all people will treat you as poorly as the Duke's people. The minute I said that Kaza's expression changed from surprise to shock to an expressionless face. I couldn't make out what emotions she felt. She stayed silent for a few seconds before she spoke with a slightly lower pitched voice. But you said I stopped her right there. I know I said it. But I think we both know I was wrong this time she stopped me. No. I thought the same thing as well back then. I just never said it. Why would you change your mind like that? So she had this thought in her mind before I said anything. In that case it's a good idea to correct it now. I realized there aren't lots of people in this world. In fact, who told you? I in any case what I'm dr. I asked who told you? No, this is easy to figure out. It's the prison again wasn't it? Her voice was noticeably deeper. What did the prison do to her? Why is she always trying to throw it under the bus? Of course not. Why would I visit those criminals? Then who told you these lies? It had to be a prisoner. No one else would try to talk to you. No way. I haven't visited a prison in years. You should trust me more Kaza. While it occurred to me that I was lying to a child, I didn't really have a choice here. I dug a hole with this lie before and I have no choice but to dig deeper. I knew I'd be caught at some point, but hopefully, it wouldn't matter by then. You're right. I should trust you more. I'm sorry Rorik. But then how did you come up with this? Thankfully, she was finally willing to listen. I was thinking about it. Her voice started to lighten. Oh, you were thinking, no wonder you came up with something like that. I'll explain it to you. How many servants and brothers and sisters and dukes are out there? Without waiting for me to respond, she continued. There are many, but how many Kazapendals are out there? One. 
How many Rorik Pendles are out there? One. So we can only trust each other. When she finished her statement she smiled at me, as if she was saying do you understand it now? To be honest, I don't understand it. There were too many flaws. As an example, there are many dukes but there's only one Duke Pendle. As another example, there are many people out there who aren't brothers, sisters, servants, or dukes. The Kaza I interacted with would never believe in an argument like this. Yet she's the one making it now. I tried to point this out. Ka. End of discussion. You'll understand better when you're rolled Rorik. I tried to reason with her again. This time by stating the flaw directly. The flaw. I said. The discussion is over now. Do you understand? This time, she chanted something and a fireball appeared in her hand. On one hand, being threatened by a child made me feel bitter and I wanted to call her bluff. On the other hand, the fireball seemed more dangerous than the ones I remembered. Furthermore, I wasn't sure whether she would throw it or not. I haven't been able to understand her actions accurately recently. No questions. As expected, those prisoners back then knew how to make you listen. Anyways, never think like that again. I'll see you at my house later, I'll leave first to clear up some space. After Kaza left the room, I couldn't help but wonder if I created a problem for myself. Announcement. I'm looking for a cover for this web novel, if you have an idea send me a message on Scribblehub or message me on Discord. Also, currency system has 3 new coins, 10 copper, 5 copper, and 10 silver. Value corresponds to number 94. Chapter 26, Sadness. I started thinking about Kaza as I walked to her residence. After our last interaction, I realized just how much she depended on our relation. She was so scared of losing it she didn't want me to make new friends. Although this was technically what I wanted to do, I wonder if her dependence on this relation went too far. Regarding the question of whether Kaza cared about me or our relation, the answer was obvious. She would have become attached to anyone who talked to her when she was neglected. The relation was the important part, the person was merely a placeholder. Honestly, I made a pretty mistake dealing with her in the past. I should have been more distant when I interacted with her. I seriously underestimated the impact that isolation and abandonment would have on a child. Kaza seemed like a relatively normal person in the past, who would expect her to start acting like this. On second thought, was she normal? All she did was study for four years before I talked to her. There's no way someone like that would be normal. I felt stupid for missing this obvious sign. The years of neglect Kaza faced were definitely enough to cause a child to go crazy. Rather, maybe it was strange that she seemed relatively normal. After all these years, no matter the case, her slight craziness combined with her overdependence on our relation sounds like a recipe of disaster for me in the future. In addition, she already started threatening me, imagine what would happen in the future, thinking about it scared me a little, however, it didn't scare me too much, the reason why Kaza was like this was that this was the only friend she had right now, once she goes to the academy, she'll definitely make more friends, as Kaza and her friends go to class, eat food in the cafeteria, and talk in their dorms, they will become closer. Their interaction will cause Kaza to realize her obsession in the past was just because she just wanted someone to talk with, and it's possible to trust other people. Even if she didn't make friends, just talking to new people should be enough for Kaza to come to the same conclusion. Therefore, I was worried about Kaza but wasn't too worried, everything should resolve itself after she goes to the academy. All I have to do is wait till then. Still, I should do my best to create some distance in our relationship. I was also a little curious about what Kaza had planned for me. It was unusual that she left for her house without me. It had to be related to magic because she knew about nothing else. At the same time, I can't use magic, so it couldn't be spells or spell books. Therefore, it was probably related to developing my phylactery. I should probably tell Kaza I'm not interested in magic anymore. The sole techniques I have should be enough to run away and live a peaceful life in some countryside, so there was no need to learn magic. Rather, learning magic might draw unwanted attention to me on the road. Well, I've already arrived at her house. I'll see what she is in store first before telling her I'm no longer interested in magic. I thought to myself as I walked through the door. Once I entered I saw a wooden circle on the floor made of books. I recognized what was happening right away. Kaza really was trying to make me develop my phylactery. When I tried to tell her it was useless, Kaza interjected. I'm a tier 3 magician now, I can definitely make you store enough mana. Kaza, 
It's not about you, I just don't have the talent. You aren't talented but I'm incredibly talented so it balances out. I sighed in exasperation. We did this a few times before but it never led to success. What Kaza was doing was trying to brute force my body into forming a phylactery. If a human can sense mana, he technically has the potential to develop an organ to manipulate mana, the phylactery. The phylactery was formed when someone stored a certain amount of mana inside their body for a long period of time, causing the body to adapt to the mana and create the organ. When I first heard that, I was incredulous. How can a body adapt to a new stimulus by forming a new organ? However, this was a fantasy world, who knows how the human body here compares to the human body in my world. Unfortunately for me, my problem was that I was barely able to store any mana or manipulate it into my body. Technically, I could form a phylactery. But realistically it would take me decades through just regular practice. The only way I had even the slightest amount of hope to form one within a decade was through using an unorthodox approach. One such approach was what Kaza was doing right now, increasing the density of mana around my surroundings. The logic is that if there is a high density of mana in my surroundings, even if I can't store mana, my body would naturally be exposed to more mana and form a phylactery. Although I said I needed to use unorthodox methods to develop my phylactery within a decade, this wasn't one of them. When Kaza first tried this method, I asked her how she thought of this. I had hoped this method would succeed until she told me she found it in one of those romance novels I handed her. Although I said that I had no faith in this method, I still let her try it multiple times, just in case. The result today was no different from the previous attempts. I had made no progress. Although I didn't mind the results, the same couldn't be said about Kaza. I'm sorry, I failed again. Kaza said in a meek voice. Her head was pointed down and her hair had hidden her eyes. I was about to say something before I had a sudden thought. So far, I've successfully managed to get close to Kaza, but perhaps I am getting too close. We can probably be considered somewhere around very good friends right now but it should probably be fine to demote our relation to good friends. Furthermore, this is the perfect time to distance our relationship. I might as well try it now. Let's see, the best way to distance our relation right now would be sadness. I put my head down and mustered up the saddest voice I could and said it's okay Kaza. Before I continued speaking, I lifted my head, squinted my eyes to pretend I was holding back tears, took a brief look at Kaza, and put my head back down. It looks like even when you advanced a tear the method still failed, I've already accepted I'll never be a magician anyways. When I finished my sentence, I started sniffling, judging by the awkward silence in the air. It looked like Kaza didn't know how to respond. It wasn't that surprising, I don't think she has encountered a situation like this in years. This was my first time acting sad in front of her. I don't feel like practicing magic today Kaza. I'll be heading back to the mansion to read a book. Before Kaza could say anything, I slowly started walking to the door. As I opened the door, Kaza started whispering. I didn't mean to. For a dramatic effect, I decided it would be better if I pretended to not hear her and shut the door before she could finish her sentence. 105. Chapter 27. The Locket. I was rather surprised when I got back to the mansion. I would have bet money that Kaza would have intercepted me to explain herself. Perhaps my actions were more effective than I thought. Honestly, I'm glad that Kaza is rather introverted, otherwise, my poor acting would have been caught immediately. For now, the plan is to avoid talking to Kaza and evading her till a few days before she leaves for the academy. Right before she leaves for the academy, I'll wish her the best of luck on her new journey. With that, the relation between Kaza and I should shift from an obsessive one to a decent one. And she should look forward to attending the academy. I am a little hypocritical here. After all, I was the one who wanted Kaza to get over dependent on me in the past. But all people make mistakes and all people are hypocrites deep down. Regarding what can go wrong with the plan, I'm not too worried because I don't believe Kaza would try to harm me when she's trying to reconcile with me. Instead, I could switch focus onto my other goals at the moment. I took out the locket I had to bury. It was the size of a small rock and shaped like an oval. Judging by how intricate the design was, the locket must have been rather expensive in the past. Unfortunately, with the number of scratches and dents on it now, the locket probably isn't worth much. I've been able to curb my curiosity for a few weeks, which is rather surprising. 
but I can no longer resist opening it. Curiosity may have killed the cat, but I don't think cats exist in this world. I locked the door of my room and activated tracking. Next, I placed the locket on my table and started examining it. I wasn't sure what type of locking mechanism lockets have. However, I suspected it was either a mechanical or magic based lock. I hoped it was mechanical otherwise I had no way of opening it. After my brief examination, I couldn't find any lock opening mechanisms. There was no button or keyhole. There was just a small rectangular opening that led to nothing but her. To my dismay, the lock was definitely some kind of magic lock. This was probably the first time I felt this sad about my inability to use magic, but I was determined to make the locket open. With how much damage it has sustained, maybe the magic lock weakened? In that case, I might be able to use brute force to open it. I tried prying the locket open but the magic was stronger than I expected. After a few minutes of trying with my hands, I tried to use the table as a lever to pry it open. After a few minutes of trying with the table, I started using everything in the room to try to open the lock, pillows, the legs of the bed, books, plates, but to no avail. I was out of breath and cursing how potent magic was in this universe. I was a fool to expect it to open that easily as well. If I was going to pry it open I would need some sort of leverage on the locket itself. Suddenly, the thought hit me. Leverage on the locket, don't I already have that? If I was right the locket didn't have a mechanical or magic lock at all. I put my nail on the small gap in the locket and began to pull. Unsurprisingly, after a small amount of force, the locket opened with a squeak. As I looked at the opened locket, I couldn't help but shake my head and laugh with a wry smile on my face. How could I have missed something so obvious? It was probably because I made a false equivalence between opening a locket and a pocket watch, but I couldn't be bothered with analyzing myself right now. The locket was open. Inside the locket was a small portrait sketch of a woman that looked like it was done by a professional. The girl had a pretty face and would have looked like a normal person if she didn't have heterochromatic eyes. With one eye blue and another brown, it gave her face an ethereal feeling. Whoever the artist was captured her emotions immaculately, as she had a smile on her face that resembled the one of the Mona Lisa. I could make a few decent guesses about her relation with Graz considering he wanted me to bury the locket. Other than the picture, the locket was rather normal. I was relieved my curiosity didn't cause a life-threatening situation, but also inexplicably disappointed at how boring the locket was. In any case, I was relieved it wouldn't be a problem to bury it anywhere. However, I had to be wary of when I was burying the locket to avoid being noticed by the person monitoring me. For now, I put the locket aside and started practicing as again. While practicing as left me with a refreshing feeling, I couldn't help but a little disappointed with my results. After a couple of hours with no progress, I spent the rest of my day reading. I was almost done reading everything I wanted to in the Pendle library. It might sound impressive, but it really wasn't. Most of the books in the library were random assortments of junk or detailed information on a specific topic I couldn't understand and the only books I read were the general knowledge books and some entertainment books. In fact, I was rather disappointed with the overall lack of books regarding neighboring countries and the outskirts of Alvin, but nobles didn't care about amassing knowledge in their library. They just needed a large number of books to use as a status symbol. As I began to rest, I realized that finishing my reading list was a rather huge problem because it was one of my main sources of entertainment. I couldn't just spend all my free time visiting the prison. Luckily, I had about a week before I ran out of books, so I could kick this can down the road for a bit and sleep peacefully. 94 Chapter 28 The Garden I was currently taking a walk through an area in the west of the Pendle Estate. It's been a week since my encounter with Kaza. The past week was fairly mundane. I practiced some soul techniques, read books, and walked around the Pendle estate. To my frustration, I still haven't made progress in as and I've begun suspecting that I was either given false information or misinterpreted something in the documents Graz gave me. As a result, instead of practicing as, I've been reading the documents Graz wrote for me. Considering that he asked me to bury his locket, I'm inclined to believe that it's my fault I haven't been able to progress in as. In addition, I've started to experiment with tracking. My experiments have no tangible goal, I just want more information on the technique. I finished the last book I wanted to read in the Pendle Estate two days ago. I'm genuinely surprised at how much I read the past four years, 
I didn't have this deep a passion for reading in my past life. I suppose reading was the most interesting thing I could have done for the past few years. However, putting the last book back on the bookshelf left me with a rather melancholic feeling. Although I enjoyed the time I spent reading, I had no clue what hobby could replace reading. I could try to reread books instead of finding a new hobby. But I'd rather try to find something new to do. As a result, I've begun to walk around the Pendle Estate. Walking around the Pendle Estate served two purposes. The first reason was to find a good location to bury the pendant. I could bury it anywhere, but, assuming Gruz didn't lie to me, I wanted to bury it in an area with picturesque scenery. I've found a few decent locations, but they were always lacking in something, whether it be the scenery or my ability to bury the locket and not get caught. The second reason was to waste time. I thought walking around could be my new hobby. Unfortunately, while walking around did help pass the time, it could only be used as a partial replacement to reading. Regardless, as I walked around for the past few days I couldn't help but be surprised at how much land the Pendle family owns. I don't think I visited the same place twice. I was even further impressed by the Pendle security. I could see guards patrolling wherever I went. At the same time, I haven't approached Kaza, nor has she approached me. If I was to guess, I think she's probably decided to practice magic and deal with her problems later. At the very least, her approach makes it easier for me to avoid her. However, I should probably figure out when she's leaving for the academy. If I assume she leaves a few days after her twelfth birthday, it should be a couple of months from now. A couple of months should be more than enough for my plans, but I should try to find out the exact date she leaves in case I'm wrong. Speaking of birthdays, my birthday is about a month from now. For the past few years, I've celebrated it with Kaza, but it looks like I'll be celebrating it by myself this time. I call it a celebration, but it's more akin to a funeral procession. Every year in this world is another year I'm not on earth. I miss the conveniences from my previous life, but more importantly, I miss my family. If I assume that I'm dead in my previous world, it meant that my family would have to deal with my death. I hope they're taking my death well. The worst possibility I could envision was my family completely fracturing, which would leave me heartbroken. However, although it's scary to imagine my family fracturing, it's not the scariest thought in my mind. What I'm scared of most is forgetting the memories of my previous life. These memories are the only thing that continues to link me and the earth. And I have this strange hope that as long as I keep these memories, I'll still have a method to return to Earth. Although I know that forgetting all my memories is an impossibility, even forgetting one or two memories makes me feel as if I've been hit by a truck. In fact, I've already forgotten a few important memories in the past decade. One of the main reasons I want to spend the rest of my life in the countryside is because I want this life to be so boring I forget as little as possible from my previous life. Seriously? I wonder how those protagonists in novels were able to throw away their attachment to their previous life. It seems impose how my thoughts were interrupted as I hit a nearby tree. As I rubbed my forehead in pain and looked at my surroundings, I found my intended destination, the West Garden. As I went into the garden, I decided to discard my current depressing thoughts and focus on the appearance of the garden instead. Juxtaposing the East Garden, the other garden I visited. The West Garden had a serene atmosphere that evoked a sense of nostalgia. However, rather than calling it a garden, it would have been more apt to call it a forest. Trees at least twice my height towered over me as I walked through the path. Surrounding the trees were blue, red, and white flowers in various patterns. While the arrangement of flowers was the same on both sides when I entered, as I went further into the garden, the patterns of the flowers on my left and right side started to diverge. When I reached the first fork in the path, the left and right hand side arrangements were completely distinct. However, although the patterns were asymmetrical, the design still maintained its original feeling of tranquility. Altogether, it made me feel as if I was in a different world. Every path I took led to different flowers, different trees, and different arrangements. I was so engrossed in the scenery I actually forgot what paths I took and when. By the time I realized it, I was lost in the garden. 73. Chapter 29, The Garden, 2. When I decided to return to the mansion, I realized I didn't remember which turns I took during my walk through the garden. However, even without remembering the exact path, 
I thought it would be easy to find the entrance because each fork in the path only occurred in the direction I was walking in. Much to my surprise, I couldn't find an exit no matter how long I walked back down the path. I wasn't quite sure but it felt like I was walking in a circle, even though the patterns of the flowers kept changing. After some time, I laid my head on a tree and started mulling over my next choice. The first option was to wait for someone to come to find me. It was the safest option, and at the same time the most boring one. The second option I had was finding a path myself. I could perhaps try to draw a map, or mark a tree on every fork in the road. There was even the option of using tracking to find a path with no obstructions, but I didn't want to use soul techniques outside if I wasn't forced to. I knew the person Duke Pendle sent to monitor me doesn't watch me closely inside buildings, but I wasn't sure how much he watched me when I'm outside. After some deliberation, I decided to go with the first option. It was getting late outside, and I wasn't in a rush to leave. I wasn't hungry either as I ate some food before I left. Furthermore, I didn't know how big the garden was, nor how far away I am from the exit. Therefore, it might take me a few hours to leave in the worst case scenario. If it turned dark while I was wandering the garden, I could lose my way even further. There was the option of straying from the path but I didn't want to stray from the path because I felt that I would get even more confused. If I was going to find an exit, it would make more sense to do so in the morning. Plus, the garden wasn't a dangerous place and had a better atmosphere for sleeping than my room. The trees were pretty comfortable as pillows as well. I wouldn't mind sleeping here for a day. I resolved to find a path by myself if I wasn't found by tomorrow. As I started relaxing under the shade of a tree, I quickly dozed off. I woke up to someone tapping my shoulder. It was a man with brown hair who looked to be someone in their twenties or thirties. He was poking me with a pointy stick. Before I could say anything, he started speaking. Who are you? I was still a bit groggy from being woken up and didn't immediately respond to the question. He didn't wait for my answer either. What are you doing here? Why are you obscuring your position through magic? Before he could question me again, I started speaking. Uck, give me one minute. I'm just waking up. Surprisingly, he did give me a minute. After I completely woke up, I started answering his questions. Regarding your first question, my name is Rorik Pendle. For your second, I was just visiting the garden. Finally, I don't know what you're talking about because I can't use mana or chi. He looked at me strangely for a second then said some sort of chant. I wasn't sure what it did, but after murmuring to himself for a bit, the man started speaking again. My apologies for misunderstanding Sir Oric my name is Lucan. Upon clearing up his misunderstanding, he apologized to me and explained what happened. Lucan was the gardener of the East Garden. He specialized in plant magic and was generally left to his whims due to the relatively isolated location of the East Garden. Besides guests, only the deceased second lady of the mansion and Duke Pendle visited the garden. While Duke Pendle came once every few months to inspect the garden, the second lady came almost weekly to enjoy it. He told me that I might have been the first Pendle since the second lady to visit this garden for a personal visit. Therefore, when he realized someone entered the garden, he was curious as to who came. His curiousness turned to wariness when he couldn't sense my position using his tracking magic and had to use plant magic to observe me. As a side note, Lucan explained that I was immune to certain kinds of magic because I don't possess any mana. Therefore, Lucan trapped me in an illusion and wanted to interrogate me to find my intentions. However, when I showed signs of genuinely being lost, Lucan started to question his original suspicions. When he realized I was a young child and sleeping in the middle of the forest without any defensive spells, he realized his original suspicions were probably wrong and woke me up. To be honest, I thought I was genuinely lost and didn't expect that I was trapped in some kind of illusion. However, thinking back to how I couldn't find a path, it made perfect sense. In general, I should probably start taking magic into account more often. As Lucan kept talking, the conversation started to derail. From apologizing, he went on to describe the contribution of each species of plant to his illusion, to describing how certain species of plant would change his illusion. It was fairly apparent that he was a plant fanatic, and I was sure the topics were probably interesting, but I didn't understand what he was talking about. I decided to try and shift the topic. Apologies for interrupting, 
But did you make this garden from scratch by yourself? No actually, I didn't make it by myself. Also, it's fine to interrupt me. I took over the garden from the old gardener who mostly made a standard garden. Although Duke Bendel gave us so much leeway, to waste it on such a standard arrangement is a shame. The gardener wasn't bad at his job. He took good care of the plants. I felt quite sad that I had to ruin his work when he retired. Ah, I forgot to mention but the East Garden was created earlier than the West Garden was. Anyways, although not many people visit it, it's still used for official visits, and it's quite a nice place to be in. In fact, the specific arrangement of plants was, as he kept talking, I could tell he was very invested in his garden. In contrast, although I did enjoy the garden, I wasn't invested in the history behind it. However, I interjected his speech with questions here and there to feign interest. For example, when he talked about plant X, I asked about specific details, such as the color or size of plant X. Sometimes, I even tried to contrast plant X with a previously mentioned plant Y. Essentially, I was giving him leading questions so he could talk more. Although I made the conversation longer than needed, it never hurt to make a good relationship with anyone when possible. After a while, the conversation started to head to a halt as he tired himself out. Wow, it's been a while since I could converse with someone who is as interested in plants as you are. I apologize for my misunderstanding earlier. No problem Lucan. It must have been strange for you when your magic didn't work. Yes. Yes it was. I almost instantaneously presumed it's an enemy because someone like you is extraordinarily rare. Ah, I don't mean it as a bad thing though. You're a great person, mana or no mana. By the way, do you mind if I go to the garden again in the future? I have no problems. In fact, it does get quite lonely sometimes. My plants and I will always welcome you with open arms. Speaking of going somewhere, I should escort you back to the mansion, it's getting quite dark. Although I insisted he didn't, Lucan still escorted me back to the mansion. Overall, the trip to the East Garden was quite an interesting one, perhaps spending time there would be a decent way to pass the time. 77. Chapter 30, The Garden, 3. I spent the next few weeks visiting the garden and talking to Lucan. Throughout our conversations, I learned a good amount about his past. He was the son of a lesser noble and decided to focus on plant magic because of a book he read in his childhood. The book's name was Tales of Eccentric Magus and was an anthology of short stories dedicated to anecdotes of great wizards. While the authenticity of these stories is lost to history, Lucan told me of the story that set him down his path. The story went like this, in a kingdom long forgotten to time. The king was facing an unsolvable dilemma. For the third year in a row, the kingdom's crops failed to grow. While the kingdom could afford to import food, if the agricultural problem wasn't resolved soon, the kingdom would face an insurmountable financial crisis. To combat the future problems, the king consulted his ministers almost weekly regarding the crops. However, None of their efforts proved fruitful. After much deliberation, the king decided to hire a royal magician specifically for agriculture. When this news was announced, magicians from all corners of the world flocked to the kingdom. During the interviews, the king and his ministers were face to face with an unusual magician. Unlike the other magicians focusing on plant magic, this magician dressed in clothes more suitable for a nomad. When the magician was asked what his qualifications were, he said that he was the reason the Fleal Forest was created. The king was perplexed when he heard that, while there was no Fleal Forest on any map, there was a Fleal Desert. When the king asked the magician if he misspoke, the magician simply smiled and said it was called the Fleal Desert before I visited it. That was the end of the story. I asked Lucan if the king hired the magician, or the kingdom's crop problem was ever resolved, but he simply shrugged and said the book never included it. In fact, he said he couldn't find a fleal forest or fleal desert in any history book he picked up. To be quite honest, I wasn't too sure how this story inspired him to become a magician focusing on plants, or why he even liked it. However, there was no point speculating on his past. Besides talking about his past, we also started conversed about botany in general. In our conversations, Lucan told me of some surprising benefits of my inability to manipulate energy. Similar to my world, there were a wide variety of plants present in this world. From plants resembling weeds to plants resembling a Venus flytrap to plants that would be regarded as aliens in my world. Contrary to my world, 
almost all plants utilize energy in some way. As a result, because I have no mana or ki many plant mechanisms wouldn't work on me. The drawback to this benefit was that some plants would be able to outright kill or injure me with relative ease. Lucans gave me a simple example. The salamander time has a defensive mechanism that causes it to close its bud when it senses internal energy in large amounts near it. In this case, large amounts of mana refers to essentially any animal for you. It would be relatively simple to take the fruit of the salamander time without it closing the bud. On the contrary, the Fenwort's defensive mechanism is to release an air blast. While everyone else can defend with internal energy, you would just get thrown back. Of course, I should mention that most lethal plant mechanisms only exist in the monster territory. Plants near this area should be generally harmless. All in all, I did enjoy talking to Lucan. Our conversations helped me fill in a lot of gaps in my general knowledge, such as the fact that mana and ki fall under a general category known as internal energy, and I could talk to someone casually without walking to the prison. Some parts of our conversation were boring, but it was always interesting seeing how much Lucan could talk about plants. Today, while I was relaxing in Lucan's garden, he suddenly brought up a strange topic. I've been thinking about this for around a week and a half now. But you and the prodigy magician get along pretty well, huh? I guess it's natural considering both of you are outcasts. I was slightly confused by his statement. I don't think I've ever spoken about Kazu unless it was in passing. I decided to answer him honestly. Yeah we're good friends. Actually, our relation is probably closer to brother and sister. When I said that Lucan raised his brow and smiled wryly. Are you sure it's just friends? He then continued with a slightly wider grin and spoke just brother and sister. At this point I was getting rather confused, Lucan didn't seem like the kind of person to make statements like this out of the blue, but before I could say anything, he continued, you don't have to hide it from me, liking someone is nothing to be embarrassed about. You know, when I was your age, besides plants, I had an interest in before he could continue talking, I interjected him and spoke with a stern voice. What are you talking about, Kaza and I are just siblings. I said it before, but you don't have to hide it from me. I don't treat you like the others in the mansion. With an even lower voice, I spoke again. There is nothing romantic between us. I said it before but Lucan tried speaking again but trailed off as I stared and interjected him. Nothing. Really, nothing? Nothing at all. Alright, I get your point. You can cease staring at me like that, but that's incredibly peculiar. When I heard what Lucan said, I relaxed and had a sigh of relief. While I may not be the oldest person in this world, I am 30, I feel absolutely nothing for a child and hate being accused of liking one. Still, I couldn't help but be curious, why would Lucan say something like that? Why did you think that I liked Kaza in the first place? What are you talking about? Anyone would have thought that because it comes straight out of the three tales from the library, doesn't it? I don't understand what you're talking about. Lucan scoffed and stared at me. Do you think I'm a fool? There's no way anyone wouldn't know. If it happened to them. He slowly stopped speaking and I saw his pupils dilate. With a slightly nervous voice, he started speaking again. Do you really not know? At this point my back was starting to sweat. I had a hunch that I hoped was false. Just say it. I really don't know what you're talking about. Lucan started speaking slowly. I'm not 100% confident, but I am around 80% confident. That girl, she put tracking magic on you for at least more than a week. To be honest, it may have been even longer. At that moment, I felt like I was a deer in the headlights. 77. Chapter 31. Contemplating. Although I was rattled I could still keep a relatively stable poker face. Furthermore, Lucan took a brief pause, which allowed me to shake off my stupor. I started thinking about why Lucan could say Kaza put magic on me with certainty. My thoughts ranged from Lucan misunderstanding something to Lucan seeing it happen. I scratched my head with one hand and spoke with the calmest voice I could muster. Are you sure it was Kazu and not someone else? Lucan looked at the leaves in the trees for a few seconds before responding. He started speaking while rubbing his chin. I can say with relative certainty. You might not know this but Duke Pendle has agents that monitor your safety. However you probably did not know that, specifically on you. The tracking magic used by those agents emits a distinct signature that serves as a premature warning to anyone trying to swindle you. 
it warns them that someone strong is protecting you. So that's the reason I was generally avoided whenever I walked outside, well at least one of the main reasons. Still, it was interesting to note that, out of all Duke Pendle's children, only I had a signature on me. Because of my inability to use mana, I would have thought I was the last person who needed one. I was tempted to ask Lucan what he meant by signature, but I decided on asking him later. I wanted to know why he was mentioning this. Although at this point, I could guess Lucan's next sentence. It is apparent that the signature on this magic is not from an agent. It doesn't have a signature at all. Therefore, it must have come from a third party. Combining my prior reasoning with your recent rumors, I can say with 99% certainty it was the little girl who put magic on you. What rumors? Amusingly, you're probably the only person who genuinely doesn't know the rumors about themselves. Rumors along with the vine state that you no longer visit prison because you were scared straight by the princess. I didn't respond to Lucan because I was pretty surprised by that rumor. I didn't think anyone cared enough about me to spread rumors besides the visiting the prison rumor. It was interesting to note that even a relatively useless son of a duke has some fame. Perhaps it was more accurate to call it infamy. I internally shook my head. That's not important right now, what's important is the reason why she put tracking magic on me. It wasn't hard to figure out the reason behind using tracking magic, she wanted to track my position. Rather, the question was why she wanted to track my position. I focused my thoughts on the most obvious conclusion. Kaza wanted to figure out when I was close to her so she could apologize. The more I thought about it, the less sense this reason made. If she really wanted to find my position to apologize, she would have approached me already. My next thought was she wanted to figure out where I went when I wasn't with her. This reason made more sense than the last one because she couldn't ask about where I went after we argued. However, rather than give me an answer, it raised more questions. She never asked me where I went, she's only asked me if I visited the prison. Does that mean she realized that I was lying? Ha ha ha, there's no way that's true. I was confident in my ability to lie to someone like Kaza. However, the more I thought about it, the less confident I became. At this point, other questions started to pop up in my head. I tried to ignore these questions but I couldn't stop my thoughts from snowballing towards them. Questions like when did start tracking me? And how often did she track me? Were broader and open to interpretation. This let my imagination run wild with sinister thoughts like she's tracked you since you've met and she tracked you every single day. The more I thought about it, the less I wanted to think about it. I felt like my privacy had been invaded. Seemingly sensing my inner thoughts, Lucan broke the silence. I can't tell you when it was put on you, but I can tell you that I only noticed it yesterday. I'm not sure if she realized that she could hide her spell using another spell's signature or if she got lucky, but the spell itself was well executed. I only noticed it through a coincidence. Luckily for you, the spell causes no harm, it just tracks the user's location and generates a heat map the caster can analyze. This version of the spell is probably somewhere in the range of tier 2 or 3 spell. It's always hard to tell with null type magic like this. In any case, finding her reasoning behind putting a spell on you would probably be a good idea. After Lucan said that, an idea popped into my head. Would it be possible for you to dissipate the spell? It would be fairly trivial but I'm not sure if I interjected him because I already thought about the consequences, I didn't need to hear his lengthy explanations. It's fine, I know that it would alert the caster, I would still like it dissipated. Well, if you insist, I suppose I can do it right now. I waited for a few seconds for Lucan to pull out a star or start chanting, but he just stood still. A few seconds later, he told me that he dispelled the magic. I thought he was joking with me. But he explained that at his level, dispelling that spell required little to no effort. As I bid him an early farewell, I couldn't help but wonder how strong he was. My decision to dispel might seem crazy, but the reasoning was solid. It's impossible to guess Kaz's intentions without actually talking to her. But I can't bring this up because she would realize someone told me about the magic. Therefore, I needed her to bring it up. The only way I can see her bringing it up is if something happens to the magic. Although she would get suspicious of me, I can just feign innocence while probing her intentions. Even if my plan went awry, Kaza has shown that the farthest she's willing to go is tracking magic. Furthermore, even if she is angry, in a few weeks she's leaving for a few years, which would presumably be long enough for her to calm down. At the very least, 
I thought this solution was better than living in fear for the next few weeks. After I returned to my room, I had very little to do. I ended up spending the rest of my day practicing my soul techniques and trying to flip a coin and catch it with one hand. The next day, as I was getting ready to leave, I heard a knock on my door. 85 Chapter 32 Probing There was only one person who would knock on my door at this time. Although I predicted her arrival, I didn't think she would come this early. As I walked towards the door, I couldn't help but fondle the pendant in my pocket. Before I opened the door, I decided to review my repertoire of excuses. I wanted to avoid scenarios where I didn't know what to say and spoke the first thought that comes to mind. In general, the main idea was to feign ignorance and give generic responses to every question. For example, if Kazu asks about my whereabouts for the past few days, I would say that I was walking around the mansion. If she asks if I went to any particular location, I'll tell her that I just found a random garden and slept there in the afternoon. If she asks me if I had anyone dispel the magic, I'll ask her what she was talking about. Out of all the scenarios I could think of, the most worrying one was if Kaza saw me talking to Lucan. I wasn't quite sure how I would respond to that because I had no idea how Kaza would react. However, that scenario was very unlikely. In the last couple of years, I've seen Kaza leave her house less than a handful of times. Most of those were her visiting me, so I'm fairly confident she wouldn't have left her house the past few weeks. I did wonder if there was some sort of spying magic she could use to observe me, but it wasn't likely since Luca never mentioned that sort of magic in our conversation. My thoughts were interrupted by a second knock on the door. It was heavier than the first and I realized I shouldn't keep her waiting. As I expected, the first thing I saw after opening the door was Kaza smiling at me. Her smile contrasted the piercing stare in her eyes. One of her hands was tightly clenched into a fist, and another had a handful of flowers. In the mansion, there was only one place where they grew. Kaza began speaking to me in a normal voice. Hey Rorik, hey Kaza, how are you? I'm fine, I just wanted to say I'm sorry about what happened back then. Are that? It's okay. I'm sorry about how I acted as well. Maybe this will be better than I expected. It looks like she just wanted to apologize. She handed me the plants. I wanted to give you these flowers as an apology. As I took the flowers, my hand brushed the bottom of their stems. All of them had a clean uniform cut. I gulped inwardly as I realized how proficient Kaza was with magic. Thank you for the flowers, I'll put them in my room. Since my main goal of dispelling the tracking magic was understanding Kaz's true intentions, I decided to start probing a little. How did you know I would like these flowers? Instantly, Kaza crossed her arms, stopped smiling, and took a deep breath in. You, you want to ask me how I know? The amount of contempt in her voice made me doubt my ears. As I remained silent, Kaza spoke in the same tone. I said. Did you want to ask me how I know? I felt some sweat accumulating on my back. Why yeah, I don't think I ever told you I liked flowers. Then come with me. Kazu approached me and grabbed my hand. Can't you just explain it here? I said as I tried to break free from her grip. No, I can't. She started pulling my hand as she walked out of my room. From past experiences, I know that in these circumstances you should never follow anyone to a secondary location. However, I couldn't break free from Kaza's grip. No matter how hard I tried I couldn't even make her arm budge. On the contrary, the more I struggled the more force she put on my hand. I stopped resisting as I realized that my hand might break if she put more pressure on it. Instead, I started thinking of an excuse for Kaza witnessing me talking to Lucan. She brought me to her house and almost threw me inside. As I held my arm in pain I heard the door close with a bang. Kaza sat down on a pile of books and stared at me intently. When she realized I wasn't speaking, she spoke in a cold tone. Rorik, do you recall what you told me after you came back from the engagement ceremony? I groaned internally. Why did I ever have to say that? Let me refresh your memory. You told me that everyone else is evil. She stood up and spoke in a sad voice. That we could only trust each other. A tear dripped down her face. We made a promise Rorik. You were the first person I made a promise to in years. But then why she started choking on her words. Why? Her lips tightened and her voice became harsher. Why did you betray me? She screamed and she stamped her foot. I realized the situation had spiraled out of control incredibly fast. But I kept quiet. I, quite stupidly, 
didn't prepare a response for this scenario and was still formulating one. I didn't want to say the first thought in my mind and repeat the same mistake that caused this. Kaza screamed at the top of her lungs why aren't you saying anything? Then started to catch her breath. No. She started speaking in a much calmer voice. No I know why you did that. You must have forgotten how scary the outside world can be. She summoned a fireball in her hand. Then let me give a simple reminder. Remember, this won't even be 1% of how scary the outside world is. Sweat was starting to build upon my back from tension and the heat of the fireball. At this point, I had no choice but to use my impromptu, imperfect excuse and hoped it worked. But Kaza, I, I don't know what you're talking about. She raised her eyes. You... You're still going to pretend that you didn't do anything. No, maybe you still don't realize what you've done. The fireball in her hand grew a bit bigger. I saw you talking to the gardener, you were smiling and laughing and completely forgot about me. Are oh, you were talking about that? I pretended to breathe out a sigh of relief. Kaza you completely misunderstood what happened. I was talking to him, but that was so I could find a present for you. The fireball became smaller. She took a step back and widened her eyes. A present. That's right a present. I wanted to give you something before you left, but I didn't know what would suit a magician. Remember that money that Duke Pendle gave me? I wanted to spend some of it on a good present for you. The reason I was talking to him so much was so he would give me better advice. I put my hand to my heart, looked down, and rubbed my eyes. I'm sorry I broke our promise but I didn't forget it. I would have asked you. But I didn't know how to approach you after we fought and wanted it to be a surprise. Was. Was that really what happened? Of course. What else could it be? You should really trust me more. Instantly the fireball vanished, and tears started appearing. I'm... I'm so sorry Rorik. I... I didn't mean... Instead of waiting for her to finish speaking, I went closer to her and spoke in a calm tone. It's okay Kaza. I forgive you. She hugged me and started sobbing. I stood still and started thinking about what just happened. After a few minutes... Kaza separated herself from me and spoke in a meek voice. I just didn't want you to make new friends and forget about me. Like I said it's okay Kaza, I'm not mad at you. I'm just a little confused. How did you know I was talking to the gardener? Her eyes avoided my gaze as she spoke. I saw you talking to him while I was practicing magic nearby. However, as she continued speaking, she made eye contact with me. I can ignore it this time, but you did break our promise. The next time you want to talk to someone else, talk to me instead. I'll tell them what you said. Okay? Okay Kaza, I promise you. She started smiling again and muttered something to herself. I could only make out the words trust, danger, and together. It was rather unnerving to hear. So I made an excuse to leave. I'll be right back Kaza, I just wanted to go get a book. Sure but it don't take too long Rorik. My walk to the library was as slow as possible. 78 Chapter 33 New Plans When I got to the mansion, I checked to make sure Kaza wasn't following me. When I was positive she wasn't, I went to my room. After I closed my door, I felt my strength leaving my legs. I slumped down to the floor and put my hands over my head. This was the closest I've come to a serious injury since coming to this world. Furthermore, it would have been from someone who I was relying on to protect me for the next few years. I couldn't help but laugh at my situation. Once I regained my composure, I picked up a random book on my bed and went back to Kaza's house. As I entered the room, I saw Kaza sitting on her bed reading a grimoire. She looked up when the door opened and greeted me with a smile as if she didn't just try to hurl a fireball at me. I smiled back and took a seat on top of some books on the opposite side of the room. I opened up to a random page in the book and started summarizing what I learned. I severely underestimated the depth of Kaza's emotional dependence on me. Of course, the entire point of approaching Kaza was to make her attached to me. But her attachment wasn't supposed to be at this level. I meant our relation to be closer to a brother-sister relationship, and I completely overshot the goal. I honestly believe that she cares more about her relationship with me than me as a person. After all, when she felt that our relationship might be threatened she was going to hurt me to neutralize the threat. I thought going to the academy would have fixed her attachment issues, but now I'm not sure. Kaz values our relation too much and she's far too emotionally unstable as a result of her life. Unfortunately for both of us, from the start, our relation was built on top of lies. The lies stacked on top of each other and now resembled a house of cards. Even a small breeze could topple it over. 
and the breeze was approaching fast. I have no doubt that Kaza will find out I lied to her by the time she returns from the academy. I can't even begin to imagine how she would react once she realized I've been visiting the prison for years after we met. To be honest, I knew my lies would have been figured out eventually. They weren't built with the idea of longevity in mind from the start. However, I thought I could just apologize to her when she found out. By the time I realized an apology wouldn't cut it, I had no choice but to cover up my lies with lies. Now it was far too late to change anything. I don't even think the situation would have gotten this out of hand if I hadn't said we can only trust each other because everyone else is evil to Kazu a few years ago. I don't know what kind of switch was flicked in her mind but I wish I knew how to turn it off. Although I do accept that it was mainly my fault her flip switched. I also put some blame on the Duke and her mother. If not for their situation neither Kazin nor I would have ever arrived at our situation. I turned the page in my book. Essentially, I had dug myself a grave and I had two options, jump into it or run far, far away from it. I'd prefer not to die a horrible death, so my only option was running. Originally, I was planning to run away when I turned 18, but now it has to be before Kaza returns from the academy. I assumed that would give me at least two to three years. I hadn't thought about it until now but running away is much harder than I originally thought. First, the Duke had someone put tracking magic on me, so running away has become a difficult task. Second, even if I did manage to run away, it wouldn't be too hard to track me down. There's probably a handful of people in the world with the inability to use any sort of internal energy. Third, it would be incredibly hard for me to protect myself once I leave this mansion. With only a couple of years, I seriously wondered if I could solve all of these problems. At the very least, I could use the soul techniques I've learned to somewhat mitigate the issue of protection. But that still leaves me with two unresolvable issues. I turned another page and started tapping my fingers together. There are only two groups I can turn to for the solution to both problems, Lucan or the prisoners. My preference was Lucan, but that would be impossible. If an employer's son asked an employee for tips on how to run away from his family, I'm quite sure that the employee would report that to the employer, especially Lucan, who views his time with plants above all else. I could only ask questions tangentially related to running away such as which wildlife plants are edible, or which plants can function as medicine. The only people I could directly ask about running away would be the prisoners. Since they're in prison, I'm sure they hold some resentment towards the Duke. Furthermore, I'm sure a few of them know about shady services for escaping this country. However, I would have to figure out how to ask them about those services, since a duke's son asking to run away is suspicious and I would have to be incredibly wary of being scammed. Once I relinquish my position as a duke's son I would probably be backstabbed instantly. Still, beggars can't be choosers, and at the very least being backstabbed would be preferable to dealing with Kaz's wrath. I chuckled internally, it was amusing how much information I was trying to squeeze out of prisoners. As I was thinking about how I could ask the prisoners, Kaza touched my shoulder. She wanted to show me a new spell she learned. Looking at Kaza performing the spell, I felt thankful that I told Lucan to dispel the tracking magic. Getting a small scare now is significantly preferable to being blindsided a few years later. Still, I wish I knew what was going on in her head. Exactly how did she interpret the last few years for things to turn out like this? 69 Chapter 34 Present Unfortunately, I don't possess mind reading abilities. I could only settle with watching Kaza use magic the rest of the day. Some of the magic she used was intriguing. For example, she created balls of light, healed small cuts, and even made the entire room turn dark. My favorite magic was when she made a bird out of fire. The combination of the flames and the bird like movement of the magic made it a surreal experience. In another timeline, perhaps I would have been able to do the same. However, what was most interesting was how Kaza could use spells continuously for at least 5 to 6 hours. I'm not sure how much mana each spell takes, but I would have thought using spells continuously would have at least made her tired. On the contrary, she had enough energy to summon multiple balls of light while walking with me to the mansion. Perhaps the spells are easier than I thought, or Kaza has an abnormal amount of mana. I shook my head. This isn't the time to focus on that. I need to figure out specific plans for the future. Instead of thinking of a long-term plan and executing it step by step, 
I decided to make small plans that I could execute interchangeably. I hoped this change would prevent my plans from going awry because it would be easier to change individual plans, but I wasn't convinced with my reasoning. The real reason was probably because I wanted to try something due to how poorly my plan regarding Kaza turned out. Out of everything I need to accomplish, the most important immediate task was making sure Kaza doesn't get mad at me before she leaves. In that case, I'll just focus on how to deal with her until she leaves. In addition, I also had to find a farewell present for her. When I thought of the excuse I used to defuse Kaz's anger, I kicked myself. Why couldn't I have just said that I was making her a present? She wouldn't have cared either way. Recently, I had lost a couple of big silver coins to the princess and now I'll lose more money because of Kaz. That money was one of the few possessions I personally owned and wasting it felt like I was parts of my soul. Unfortunately, in this situation I have to bite the bullet. As a result, I spent the next couple weeks visiting Kaza. My routine was mundane, I woke up, visited Kaza, reread books, and watched her use magic. The only deviation occurred on my birthday, when Kaza spent the whole day talking to me. While I welcomed the change of pace, celebrating my birthday in this world was depressing. Currently, it was a couple of days before Kaza's birthday. Instead of staying with Kaza, I told her I was going to buy her present. She insisted on coming with me, but I insisted on it being a surprise. As I walked to town, I kept looking behind my shoulder. My budget for her present was one big silver coin, hidden inside of my shoe. Although walking around was awkward, because the coin kept moving around my foot. It brought me a sense of security. I was carrying a lot of money and I wasn't sure how fast I would receive protection from the person tracking me. When I walked to the entrance of the shopping district, I was hit by a wave of nostalgia, the bustling streets, the constant traffic of people and carriages, and the smell of the street-side food stalls reminded me of my previous life. As I walked through the market, I couldn't find a shop that sold magic items. I entered a variety of shops. But the minute I asked about magic items they gave me a strange look and told me they didn't sell them. I also noticed the changing demographics as I went deeper into the district. There were more horse carriages, and fewer food stalls. The store employees were nicer as well, since they explained why I couldn't find any magic tools. It turns out selling magic items required a license and proximity to a magic association, and this district was too far away to qualify. I was disappointed I couldn't find a magic tool, and realized it would take too much time and effort to go to a store that sold magic items. Since I already came this far, might as well get something. I thought to myself as I entered a jewelry shop. I hoped a piece of jewelry would make her forget my original promise. Entering the jewelry shop, the first thing I noticed was the number of security guards they had. Every other shop I visited either had one or zero security guards but the jewelry shop had five near the entrance. I wasn't sure of their strength, but they looked intimidating. As I walked through the store, looking for a piece of jewelry, an employee greeted me. Hello, are you looking for your parents? I instantly chuckled, sometimes I forget how old I am myself. I smiled at the employee and responded, No, I'm here to buy a present. Oh my apologies, you're more mature than you look. I can help you out. How much money are you willing to spend? and is your present for a boy or a girl? It's for a girl, and my budget is a big silver coin. Take a seat right here and give me a few minutes. The employee left and came back with a tray full of rings. Would you be interested in any of these? I gave him a wry smile, I would prefer a pendant as opposed to a ring. He gave me a look of pity, apologized and brought back a tray full of pendants. After examining the tray, I picked out the pendant with a silver chain and black stone as the focal point. I thought it would be a good fit because it resembled Kaz's eye and hair color. By the time I had left the shop, it was turning dark. I could only hope that Kaza would like my gift. 71 Chapter 35 Farewell A few days passed, and Kaz's birthday arrived. I woke up in the morning with a smile on my face. I pounded my fists together and jumped out of my bed. Today was going to be a good day. I could feel it. After all, Kaza will leave to the academy. And I won't have to deal with her anymore. Although it might seem heartless, Kaza going to the academy was the best case scenario for both of us. I could further my plans with no constraints, and Kaza would be able to learn advanced magic to her heart's content. Furthermore, 
she might even make friends, which could fix the problems in her personality. I got off my bed with a jump and went to my cabinet. I opened the third shelf and took out a small wooden box from inside. Inside the box was the pendant I bought the other day. When I bought the pendant, the employee wished me luck and gave me this box for free. I was certain he misunderstood my situation and I think I might have been overcharged for the pendant, but I accepted the box nonetheless. There was nothing special about the box. It was a bare wooden box, and it could barely hold the pendant. Once I verified the pendant was still there, I put the box away and began my morning routine. I've recently reincorporated studying tracking again into my routine. Although I mastered tracking, I should change this name since there's also tracking magic. I thought it was a good idea to keep practice it in order to keep it in memory. In my practice, I focused on efficiency over all else. Once I finished my practice with tracking, I began relearning as. It was frustrating how little progress I was making with as. I was extremely close to forming the first soul vein yet kept missing the final connection. I hoped it was more of an experience issue than an understanding issue, but the only thing I could do was keep practicing and hoping it clicks one day. Perhaps the gods of luck took pity on me, or my different attitude had an effect. But on my first attempt, I managed to form my soul vein. Having a soul vein, was an indescribable feeling, however, it didn't really feel good or bad. Either way, with the first soul vein formed, I could start practicing the reinforcement part of as. I finally understood what Lucan was referring to when he said as was incredibly uncomfortable. The moment I tried the reinforcement part of as. It felt like a worm was moving around inside my skin. I couldn't even practice it for a few seconds without stopping in disgust. Instead of forcing the issue, I decided to finish my practice early. I still had some time before I went to Kaza's house, so I decided to read a book about the geography of Alvin. Although I did buy a map, I wanted to cross-reference as many resources as possible to avoid future problems. Furthermore, while borders and the monster habitats could change frequently, Geography only changes in once-in-a-lifetime events, so the book would generally still be accurate. I lost track of time, and by the time I finished reading a couple of chapters, it was time to leave. I went to my cabinet and took the pendant out of the box. I was debating whether to bring it in the box, but I felt storing it in my pocket would be the safer option. I didn't want Kaza to misunderstand anything. I stopped by the kitchen and brought some fruits before I went to Kaza's house. Before I could even knock on the door, Kaza opened it and greeted me. Hey Rorik, you seem happier than usual. I thought I was hiding it well, but Kaza noticed it immediately. I wondered if it was because my expression was obvious or she had gotten better at reading me. In any case, this was a rare occasion where I could express my true thoughts without lying. Of course I'm happy. It's your birthday. That's true, but today is also the day I leave. You're looking at it the wrong way, you aren't leaving, you're finding new opportunities. It's not like you can never come back. You should focus on your opportunity to learn more magic. But, don't worry about it, it's just a few years. Plus if you have time you can always write a letter. Will you write back if I send you a letter? Of course I'll write back. Now let me inside. These fruits are heavy. I put the basket of fruits down and passed Kaza a rind fruit. While she was eating I took a look around the room. It was still as messy as before. I was curious about what would happen to all of the books when she leaves. When she finished eating, I asked her about it. What's going to happen to all these books when you leave? These books? I'm not taking them with me so I don't know. Maybe Duke Pendle will put them back into storage. These were specifically bought for me so there's not much he wants to do with them, but if you want to take a book I'm sure no one would notice. I think an introduction to magic for beginners would be a good choice. No, you misunderstood. I didn't want to take a book, there's no point since I can't use mana. I was just curious. Still, even if you can't learn magic, you should take a book. What if you forget our promise? What if you forget about me? Ha ha ha. Trust me Kaza I'll never forget about you. Even when you're at the academy, you'll always be in the back of my mind. Talking to you was the most impactful decision of my life. Rorik, I took out the pendant from my pocket. As thanks for all these years of interesting moments, I brought you a gift. I tried to find a magic item, but I couldn't find any so I got this pendant instead. I, the look in Kaza's eyes stopped me in my tracks. I didn't know how to describe it but her eyes weren't normal. They were dilated wider than I ever thought possible. 
but it didn't matter too much to me now, she was leaving. Kaza held the pendant in her hand like it was a bar of gold. Rorik, I don't I don't know how to thank you. No need to thank me Kaza. We're brother and sister after all. I don't think we'll see each other too often anymore, so consider this a farewell gift. We, we're more than just brother and sister. I'll come back for you Rorik, I'll definitely come back for you. Focus on your magic training first Kaza. Thoughts like that can come later. We spend the rest of the day talking and eating fruits. When nightfall came, a butler came to take Kaza to a carriage. I walked her to the carriage and waved her farewell. She waved back and mouthed the words I'll come back. I laughed and waved until she left my view. Once I was sure she was gone, I let out a sigh and silly grin came on my face. I was free. I really did feel bad for Kaza, she didn't have a great childhood and I wished that the academy and her future gave her happiness. I just hoped her happiness didn't involve me. 79. Chapter 36. Time passes. Announcement. It has been a while but I apologize and I am back. If you're an old reader you might be wondering what happened to a few chapters, 37 to 40. I've decided to rewrite from 36 onwards. It's been a while since I've written anything so any feedback would be helpful. I woke up with a groggy mind. I felt like I slept for two years. A few weeks passed since Kaza left. I wish I could say I did something, but I really didn't. Every day I woke up, took a walk around the Pendle Territory, ate food, and slept. At this point, I've given up getting any more information from the prison. And Lucan, the only person who would still talk to me, is currently busy. The absence of a conversation partner was apparent as I began to talk to myself more. While I was happy to get Kaza out of my hair, a part of me wished she would at least have sent a letter. Wrong, wrong, wrong I told myself while lightly slapping my cheeks and walking towards the yard. I need to be happy that she left. Hopefully, she finds some friends and matures a bit. I stopped myself and put my hand on my forehead. I had a realization. Kaza is not the only person who needed to mature. I sat on the ground and continued thinking, have I really done anything that could be considered fitting for a transmigrator? I've been here for 10 years and the only tangible thing I've done is made one friend and semi master one soul technique. I've had one idea of running away but I've gone about the most immature way of trying to achieve it. I felt frustration building up. I need to. TCH. I was awakened from my thoughts by the scoff of one of the butlers of the estate. As I stared at him, he gave me a look before scoffing. While I looked at him, he cast me a glance followed by a dismissive snort. As he walked away with his friends I could only clench my fists. I can't continue this way. I said as I stormed into my room. I locked my door, spread out my current materials, and brainstormed. I kept writing and writing, scratching out one plan and writing two new ones. Only stopping once I drifted off to sleep. I woke up the next day with a fire in my stomach. I was incredibly hungry. After eating breakfast, I sat down and looked through my plans. I kept throwing plans out till I was only left with three. The first plan was titled Steps to Run Away. In this plan, I detailed what I thought were the necessary steps to running away on my own successfully. While I had already accomplished some of them, having sold techniques, buying a map, and charting out a few routes, other important steps were not even close to being done. For instance, I still hadn't mastered my soul techniques, and I didn't have the knowledge or ability to survive on my own in the wild. I wasn't able to find a plan to fix the first problem. But the latter had a simple solution. I could do missions in the Adventurer Guild. While 90% of the upper rank missions were nigh impossible feats for my body specs, I could most certainly do quests for the lowest adventurers killing goblins, slimes, or picking up herbs. The quest rewards wouldn't be great, but the knowledge about the terrain and monster behavior would be invaluable for any escape attempts in the future. Furthermore, I could use this as an excuse to ask my Duke Pendle to get me whatever the equivalent of a personal trainer was in this world, which would boost my physical capabilities. The next plan was titled Lazy. This plan was simple. Just relax and do nothing. Having a plan like this after yesterday might seem illogical, but it actually made a lot of sense. Kaza won't be coming back for a few years at least, and I'm in no rush to run away from the Pendle Territory. In that case, why not relax and have fun? I've never had a chance to really experience this world. In fact, I know absolutely nothing about the culture, whether it be the food, the music, 
or anything else. I even have some pocket money that I can use to splurge on the highest forms of entertainment for a few months. Maybe I could even meet some interesting people who would help me in unexpected ways. The last plan was titled Merchant. This idea was plagiarized from the stories in my previous world. Use my knowledge from there to build a shop and sell some items. If successful, I would ask Duke Pendle to help me establish a shop in a different country, then stay in that country and never come back. If my business was successful, I might even be able to attract investors and skip asking Duke Pendle entirely. While this plan was the most straightforward in accomplishing my task, it had one huge flaw. What business could I do? Food is simple, and a classic, but I'm not sure I could do it. There were a few huge problems I couldn't overcome. How the ingredients translate, how cooking works in this world, and most importantly, how to cook. It's been around 10 years since I've made myself a real meal and I'm not no longer confident in my skills. Additionally, I don't want to be labeled as a crazy food guy if the food from my previous world is unappetizing to the people here. Since food seemed difficult, I was leaning towards selling a product. While I don't think I could make something as complicated as a gun, I can still remember simple toys and board games. Furthermore, I've seen the board games and toys they have to offer here and it's nothing special. The only drawback of this idea is plagiarism. I was scared of merchants stealing and replicating my ideas since there might not be something like a patent or copyright in this world. While I do technically have the status of a duke's son, it's genuinely worthless in my circumstances. While I could debate the benefits and drawbacks of all three plans with myself for months. I decided on making a decision today. I didn't want to procrastinate and do nothing anymore. After some deliberation, and lunch, I made a decision. 17. Chapter 37. Time passes. 2. After Kaza left, I forgot what tension felt like. But the current situation served as a strong reminder. Duke Pendle comfortably sat in his chair, staring directly into my eyes. The metronomic tick of the clock broke the deafening silence. I tried my best to avoid the uncomfortable eye contact by staring at the bookshelves to his sides. I was confused, both by the titles of the books, and how I could continue this conversation. Luckily, I didn't have to. After who knows how many minutes passed, Duke Pendle began tapping his desk. As the silence faded away, he began to speak in a slow voice. It has been a while since we've talked hasn't it Rorick? It certainly has Duke. It's always an honor to talk to you. I wish I could say it was the same. Tell me, did you really decide to disturb my work with this such a trivial matter? I apologize but, if the apology was sincere then I would advise you to return to your chambers. In due time I shall arrange someone to take care of this request. Just like that. The first conversation in a long time I had with my current further was over. While it was disappointing that I was shut out so quickly, at least I probably accomplished my goal of this visit. After careful consideration in the morning, I decided to pick plan 1. Plan 3 can be implemented at almost any time in just about any place. While plan 2 would have been fun to do, it wasn't a plan that was very beneficial in the long run. Most importantly, I was scared that plan 1 would lose its effectiveness the later I started. Therefore, in hindsight, was obvious. Since the Duke gave his affirmation, all I had to do was wait for a visit. A few hours later, while I was reading a book in my room, I heard a knock on the door. I was taken aback because I honestly didn't expect the Duke to find someone in just a few hours. I opened the door and looked at the man in front of me. At first, I thought it was a butler, but I knew I was mistaken immediately, dressed in casual clothing, twice my size, and a bright yet intimidating smile. I could tell he was a knight. I was surprised by the promptness of the duke, before I could say anything. He spoke in a booming voice while extending his hand. Hello Sir Rorick, my name is Joseph, and I'm in charge of your physical training. I was a bit shocked by his cordial tone, but I quickly returned to my senses as I shook his hand and began to strike up a conversation. You can just call me Rorick. It's a pleasure, Joseph, are you a knight? That's right. I'm not just any knight though. I'm a knight who specializes in physical training. I was picked to make sure you have a great routine. Plus, this is a great opportunity for me to take a break from knight training. His friendly tone now made sense. If I wasn't pleased with him, I could request a new instructor and he would have to go back to training. Still, it was nice to have a real chat after a while. That's surprising, I assumed you would like knight training since you said you liked physical training. 
Ha 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 I wish night training was only about building my muscles. I also need to do mana training. He scratched the back of his head while laughing. I'm not actually very good at it though, so I have to work twice as hard. I've hit a roadblock in my training right now so I decided to take a break. Anyways, we've talked enough, let's start training right now. Right now? Of course. You haven't trained when you were younger. So you have to work four times as hard to recoup those lost years. Maybe it would be more beneficial if we started on a new day. I still have some things I want to finish. Rorik, haven't you heard the saying? The best time to start training was yesterday. But the second best time is today. Now let's see what you're made of. While I was surprised the saying existed in this world, he grabbed me by the shoulders and dragged me into the forest outside. He finally stopped when we were near a large clearing. Now. Run laps in this field until you get tired. Is there a specific amount of laps I should be aiming for? Nope. Keep running until you drop. This will help me measure your athletic level before we begin. I gave him a weird look and began running. The first lap was easy. My breath was steady and I kept a constant pace throughout it. The second and third laps were similarly easy. However, as I was finishing my third I began noticing how big the field was. Was this clearing here before? I wasn't sure but I knew I had to slow my speed. Even at this speed, the fourth and fifth laps were done in no time. I was having trouble catching my breath now and decided to slow down even further. But I heard Joseph shouting from the other side. No slacking off. Keep the current pace for the rest of your laps. I can't keep going at this pace. I told him as I felt my fatigue building. Unfortunately, he replied curtly with no excuses. As I began the seventh lap I began struggling for air. Somehow, I managed to power through to the end. I started catching my breath before Joseph tapped me and handed me some water. What is it? I replied with some annoyance as I felt the water trickle down my throat. It wasn't a great attempt. But at least we have a lot to work on. Next, let's see how strong your muscles are. Before I could grasp what happened, we began the next exercise. Then the next. Then the next. By the time it was night, I felt like I was fainting. I was able to muster the determination to my bed by remembering what Joseph said earlier. It will take me some time to create a regimen for you. So you're free for today. I drifted off to sleep wishing it would take him at least a week to figure it all out. 11. Illustrations. This will keep getting updated as I make one for the characters. I'm only posting one per character here but I do have more in my Discord. AI generated. Kaza. Elsa, 16, Chapter 38, Change. Even in my dreams, I couldn't escape. My current workout was the doing of my dream demon. Currently, I am climbing a mountain after I ran 100 laps across a stadium. I wasn't sure why the workout was this eccentric, but I wasn't too bothered. This was a dream. Unlike real life, where my stamina barely kept me going for 10 laps, here I could keep going for as long as I wished. Climbing the mountain was a cinch. However, as I neared the precipice, a sudden gust of wind shook me off the mountain. Instinctively, I braced for impact, but before I went splat, my eyes opened and I woke up. I still felt like I was being shaken off the mountain, so I turned my head to the side to see Joseph almost push me off the bed. What's going on? Why the hell are you here? I replied with a groggy voice. Well, it's 10 a.m. Rorik way past the time for you to get up so we can start your morning workout. I was surprised it was already 10 a.m. This was one of the few times I overslept, and it felt like I slept for only 5 hours despite sleeping for 10. Give me a few minutes to get ready. No problem, I'll be waiting outside. After taking about thrice as long as I usually would get ready, I sadly left my room. Alright, now follow me to the training ground. While I followed Joseph. I kept wondering at the back of my mind if picking plan 1 was the right decision. Unfortunately, it was too late to back out now. Thus, my routine for the next few weeks began. I trained with Joseph morning and night. The schedule was brutal. And I felt like I was at death's door at the end of every day. On the bright side, the workout was only in the morning and night, so I had the afternoons to indulge in all of my hobbies. Well, just reading. I was too tired to walk around and I really didn't have anything else to do. If you were getting points for reading books more than 10 times, I would have at least 30 points right now. The monotony of my routine wasn't broken until one day. I received a letter from Kaza. 
Upon seeing the letter, I took a moment to compose myself and regain control of my emotions. I was happy that I was able to disrupt my boring life, anxious because I didn't know what would be in the letter, and curious as to how she was managing in school. I was about to open it, but quickly put it down. After repeating this a few times, I finally opened the letter and began reading it to myself. Hello Rorik, sorry for not sending you a letter sooner. It took me longer than I expected to get accustomed to the capital. It's a place even more incredible than I imagined. There's so much magic that I can still learn. Don't worry though, I haven't forgotten about you. Were you lonely? I bet you were since no one talks to you. I know how it feels since I lived like that before you came. But don't worry Rorik, I'll keep sending you letters to keep you entertained. You just have to keep looking forward to them. I hope you don't fall back into bad habits Rorik. Especially visiting the prison and talking to other people. I don't want to have to reprimand you. Remember, everyone lies to us and we can only trust each other. I should do all the talking since I can defend myself. While you can just trust me. For now, just read books. My professors said that I could definitely skip classes so I will finish this roadblock in no time. From, Kaza. After finishing, I silently held the letter in my hand for a few minutes. To make sure I wasn't hallucinating out of fatigue, I read the letter a few more times, then put it back in its envelope. After placing it on a table, I let out a breath in exasperation. Change takes time. It's only been a few weeks. Soon everything will work out. I muttered to myself as I rubbed my temples. I opened a drawer underneath the table and began quickly writing a short reply. Hello, Kaza. Thank you for writing a letter. Truth be told, I am a little lonely without your presence, but I'll take your advice about not falling into old habits in mind. Don't forget that a castle isn't built in a day. Take as much time as you need in magic school, I won't be going anywhere. From, Rorik, as I finished writing the reply. I began thinking about some of my old habits. In particular, I realized it had been a while since I practiced soul techniques. Since I was making no progress, I initially wanted to take a small break. Unfortunately, the intensity of the workout made me forget about it for a few days. I guess I should get back into the habit. These will be my trump cards in the future. After all, by the time I finished writing the letter, it was time for the afternoon training session. I let out a small groan before leaving and walking to Joseph. I took the letter with me so I could ask him how to get it mailed. Luckily, he was pretty happy to help me. After that brief delay, we trained till night. After returning to my room, I practiced my soul techniques. Immediately I noticed something was off. While tracking showed no differences, when I practiced as, I felt something inexplicable happening. It felt like my body was absorbing the soul essence directly. As if to prove this, I instantly felt rejuvenated. Immediately, I jumped out of my bed, ran to my bookshelf, and began reading information about as. After a few minutes of dedicated reading, I came to a simple conclusion. I had absolutely no clue what was going on. My hands were on my head and I leaned into my chair. I realized I might have gotten myself into another mess. 15. Chapter 39. Change. Two. Next, I closed my eyes and began regulating my breath to calm my nerves. This was a critical juncture, and allowing nervousness and panic to take hold would result in disastrous consequences. I increased the intensity of my breathing to match my nervous, out-of-control heart rate. Gradually, by bolting down in place and meditating I was able to calm my wandering mind. Unfortunately, my heart was still trying to burst out of my chest. If my heart was given any leeway, it would abandon me without hesitation. Despite being in a paradoxical state of a nervous heart and calm brain, I decided now was a decent time to think of my next steps. Before taking any concrete actions, it was important for me to understand why I's changed. Luckily, it wasn't required to be an expert on soul techniques to comprehend the reason behind Az's transformation. The only major and relevant change in my routine has been the demanding physical workouts every day. On the other hand, you did have to be an expert to understand why these workouts influenced Az. Since this question couldn't be answered by me, I decided to skip it entirely. The simple and straightforward solution was to put the workouts on abeyance. Should Az return to normal? Everything would return to square one, and I could move on with another plan. Yet, I couldn't know I didn't want to commit starting over from square one. For how long has as troubled me? For far too long. I achieved virtually no results in using as until now. 
the byproduct of the change is a beneficial one. The muscle pain that plagued me even through my rest days vanished into thin air. It was obvious my quality of life would skyrocket if I could successfully incorporate as into my routine. The tussle between stopping and continuing plagued my mind the entire night, even after I decided to sleep on the issue. It was far too stimulating for my brain, which had been bored to death by the monotony of my recent lifestyle. In a strange twist. This time it was my heart trying to stop my racing brain. By the time I felt an inkling of sleep, the sun began to shine on my face. Knowing I didn't have much time before I met with Joseph, I came to a decision. Sorry Joseph, I had a tough time sleeping today and feel sick. Could I take a break for today? Um, sure, you've never made excuses before, so I have no reason not to believe you. With the rest of the day at my disposal. I decided to sleep before I thought any further about my decision. When I woke up, it was already afternoon. Time to figure something out. I told myself while eating lunch. The next few hours were spent on my internal debate. Both options had their positives and negatives. Stopping everything meant I had to put my faith in another plan while continuing could lead to unintended effects down the road. In the end, the middle of the road option was most appealing to me because I didn't want to give up perhaps the only chance I had to benefit from as. I will continue to work out without using as for a few days, if there were no physical or internal changes in my body. I would then start to use as to restore my muscle fatigue. This decision stemmed from the fact that as in its current state is extremely useful for the future. I really didn't want to waste the potential of as especially considering that it was perhaps the only thing I could get my hands on that could boost my physical ability. I'm ashamed to say it but my plan didn't last long. The week of buffer intended was shortened into three days. After I couldn't overcome the temptation of healing my muscle pain. The blame can't solely be attributed to myself when Joseph replied to my question with a laugh and said feeling muscle fatigue isn't a bad thing. It's part of the process that your body takes on while building muscle. Healing it through external stimuli would hamper results. Technically, since soul techniques are internal stimuli, I'm still following Joseph's rules. Instead, I decided to keep a strict cap on the amount of times I used as. For the last few weeks, I let myself use as twice a day. I use the technique after the morning and night workouts respectively. Safe to say the results were astounding. The amount of free time per day was essentially doubled. Furthermore, the day became much more pleasant. No longer did I have to rub ointment on my hands and legs while spending most of the day in bed reading. While there still wasn't much I could do, going outside was a breath of fresh air. For the first time in a while, it felt like I was truly a person in a fantasy world. In addition, I also felt like my body was building muscle faster. I didn't dwell too much on this idea though. It was entirely speculation and I felt like it may have been the placebo effect. Plus, I could always confirm regardless. The lack of a negative combined with the overwhelming positives led to a simple conclusion. Incorporate as into my routine. The next few months were no longer as boring as before. Initially only doing it twice a day, the benefits from as somewhat forced me to increase my usage of it. Now, I used as whenever I felt any form of muscle fatigue. In addition to using it more frequently, I also experimented with as itself. Sometimes I increased the intensity of it, while other times I tried to focus it in one area. Besides the entertainment from my investigation of as, I also continued to receive letters from Kaza. They were about the same as the first one I received. On the bright side, she recently made some friends. I was hoping that in the next few months, her experiences with her friends would reduce my reliance on her. Lastly, a few days ago, my routine with Joseph changed drastically. 5. 